U.S. Space Strategy and Indo-Pacific Cooperation. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Our mission here at Hudson is to promote U.S. international leadership and global engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future. Key to Hudson ever since our founding by uh, the late geostrategist Herman Kahn has been policy work at the intersection of technology, policy, and strategy, focusing in particular on the critical need to maintain America's qualitative edge especially in partnership with our allies. Uh, we've also had a very special focus on U.S.-Japan relations and on Japan uh, since Herman Kahn's day. Now as uh, space looms ever closer as the uh, next frontier, a place where there is immense potential for humankind, but also an area that poses unique geostrategic challenges, uh, many of which parallel those here on Earth. Uh, we thought we'd take this opportunity to examine Indo-Pacific uh, cooperation on space questions. Uh, as our event gets underway, I want to acknowledge uh, Hudson's Japan Chair, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. H.R. needs no introduction. He's a forward-thinking, unconventional strategist, and we're immensely grateful uh, for his presence here at Hudson, for his service to our country in the Army, in the Trump administration, and now here at Hudson. Also want to acknowledge the quarterback of today's event, uh, Dr. Patrick Cronin, Hudson's Asia Pacific Security Chair. Patrick is a, a prolific and insightful scholar who is dedicated to analyzing and staying ahead of security threats in the Indo-Pacific, and we're very fortunate as well to have him here at Hudson. Uh, and, and in addition to a superb first-class team of uh, panelists, scholars, uh, that you will hear shortly. I also especially want to thank uh, Dr. John Mankin, the president of Artemis Innovation Management Systems, uh, an international leader on an array of space issues who will be keynoting our event this morning, and I'll be introducing him shortly. Space, let's face it, we've come a long way in the last 50 years since the moon landing. Space is no longer an exclusive frontier available only to a few, as Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Hyden, has noted. Here in Washington, it's now become a key priority for our leaders in the White House, for lawmakers on Capitol Hill, investors in Silicon Valley, and for our joint military forces. It's also a frontier that a growing number of countries are seeking to explore, and which private industry is increasingly providing the lift to reach, uh, with a focus uh, on, a, on the potential natural resource extraction, and even the potential habitability for mankind in space. Unfortunately, however, not all actors are committed to the responsible and sustainable use of space. Our adversaries have and are pursuing counter space weapons and strengthening their military space programs. Of course, China's 2007 successful test of an anti-satellite uh, and ASAT weapon was a wake-up call for many and signaled that space was no longer a safe and secure domain, that one could be exploited to, as others have noted, quote, leave us left leave us deaf, dumb, and blind in seconds. The ASAT test showed us just how vulnerable our space assets are, particularly given our dependence on space-based systems from uh, GPS, ISR, and in communications. And it, at this intersection, uh, the uh, commander of the newly set up US Space Command, General Raymond, has prudently noted, quote, that our level of superiority is diminishing. And we're trying to reprioritize space to meet these threats as evidenced by uh, the Trump administration's revival of the National Space Council and under the dedicated leadership of a man who I think would describe himself as a bit of a space geek, and that's Vice President Pence, who's been uh, uh, focused on space issues uh, even before he got to uh, Congress. Uh, congressional efforts to lay the legal and financial framework for a DOD restructuring, including a space development agency, a space corps, force and a new combatant command, the promotion of space experts within our various service branches, uh, obviously the reestablishment of a space-focused combatant command, and increasing cooperation and collaboration between commercial and government organizations. But we need to do more, and we can't do it alone. Space is obviously the largest and the most unpredictable physical domain, one that's going to require strategy and cooperation to face future security challenges. Uh, as we partner together with the Japanese in particular, the Indians as well, on the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific concept, uh, we also need to start to think through ways that our three, that our nations can work together uh, in space efforts. Uh, 
strengthening partnerships to improve interoperability to ensure effective deterrence and defense, considering each nation's individual strength and how to leverage them. And I think that uh, our conference today is going to allow us to explore these issues and uh, to figure out ways to, to deepen our coordination going forward. Uh, and there, there are lots of different questions that we're going to explore. Obviously, our satellites are vulnerable to strategic attacks, but they're also vulnerable to the uh, challenge of uh, collision with other satellites and various debris in space, something that we at Hudson, through our Space 2.0 initiative that looks at uh, the future of exploration of space, the growing privatization of space, how to maintain US leadership in that domain has already focused on. It's, it's increasingly critical for all of our nations to invest in infrastructure. And I think here is where the US-Japan partnership has become particularly critical, especially as Prime Minister Abe and President Trump uh, have recently agreed that our two countries should partner on the US program to bring to return uh, manned exploration to the moon by 2024 with Japan uh, helping uh, in significant ways in technical cooperation for this future lunar exploration. So with those uh, opening thoughts to sort of lay the groundwork for today's discussion, I'm delighted uh, to be able to introduce Dr. John Mankins, the uh, president of Artemis Innovation Management Systems, who is our keynote today. He is, as we all know, an international leader in space systems and technology innovation, highly effective manager of large-scale R&D programs, widely consulted on R&D management and space issues uh, here in DC and around the world. Spent uh, 25 years at NASA and at Caltech's Jet Propulsion Lab and his projects uh, included uh, space mission operations, flight projects, system level innovation, advanced technology research and development, uh, and the like. Uh, at NASA, he was manager of exploration systems research and technology, and uh, was responsible for more than 100 individual projects with over 3,000 personnel. He was also the manager of the advanced concepts studies at NASA and the lead for critical studies of space solar power, highly reusable space transportation, affordable human exploration approaches, and many other topics. His significant accomplishments have earned him numerous awards and honors, including the prestigious National, uh, NASA Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal, of which he was the uh, first recipient. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give Dr. John Mankins a warm <laughs> welcome. Good morning. It is a great pleasure to be here at the Hudson Institute uh, and uh, a tremendous uh, pleasure also to be speaking on this particular subject, uh, one on which I have spent uh, quite a few decades and uh, which I regard as absolutely essential uh, to uh, both uh, our future in the US and the global future. So uh, this morning, uh, I would like to uh, present to you a vision of the future which will be radically different uh, than everything we think we know about space and space activity and the space of developments, uh, the pace of developments vis-a-vis -vis space. These changes are being driven first and foremost by dramatically lower launch costs. Uh, secondly, enabled by those dramatically lower launch costs, by the uh, emergence of a completely new family of players, both in terms of individuals and firms and uh, sources of, of uh, capital and the kinds of uh, missions and markets that are being opened. A whole new range of new system concepts and uh, types of investments in systems, which is both uh, now emerging and coming uh, ever faster a set of technology transformations which have been uh, well known on the ground here on Earth, but have been slow to propagate into space systems. And this is rapidly changing as well. Uh, and as a consequence of the above uh, urgently new policy issues and opportunities. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I'm presenting you with an argument that everything we think we've known about space uh, during the last 50 years uh, is about to change radically and quickly. 
And this is the fundamental transformation. Orders of magnitude reduction in the cost of launch. And I, I apologize, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but I wanted to get it into the uh, record. A number of my charts have a little bit of data and a few images to look at. Uh, the world changed four years ago next month uh, with the first Falcon 9 reusable stage landing successfully back on Earth. And if you look at things that were written 10 years ago or even eight years ago, uh, you don't see any regular, it's like, it's like looking at a movie from before mobile phones. You don't realize how ubiquitous these po pocket computers are and the interconnectivity of today's world until you look at a movie from 1997. And other than, other than uh, the interconnectivity and computing and so on, it's almost, uh, it's hard to tell that it's a completely different world now. But if you go through an airport, every other person you see is looking at their device is connected to somebody half a world away, is somehow using the assets in space that uh, were mentioned a moment ago, is somehow, et cetera. This transformation, the transformation in launch, is going to be even more profound, I believe. Uh, in particular, Falcon 9, Falcon 9 Heavy, the Falcon 9 Reusable, is just the tip of the iceberg, essentially substituting computational power and the ability to control at the individual uh, rocket engine level a, uh, a fully reusable vertically landing vehicle, getting rid of essentially the whole uh, requirement that we believed in the space shuttle and other vehicles for thermal protection systems, aerodynamic re-entry, uh, all of that stuff just going away for the first stage uh, and the change that it brings to the cost of access to space. Whereas uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was typical to talk about 15 to $20,000 per kilogram. Uh, today, the price points which are being listed and which will be delivered not only by SpaceX, but shortly by Blue Origin uh, are down around $1,500 a kilogram. So a fact, an order of magnitude reduction. Uh, and soon with uh, New Glenn and, uh, and at least uh, SpaceX is arguing uh, with the Starship and the Heavy Booster, $200 a kilogram. And it's not just SpaceX and Blue Origin. If you look at what's going on in the international community, all sorts of companies are trying to catch up. They're all now working on computationally controlled, thrust vector controlled boosters and stages that will be able to achieve these same kinds of feat. Not today, but soon. I would say within 10 to 12 years at most. So this has tremendously far-reaching impacts because as uh, was mentioned by Heinlein many years ago, low Earth orbit is halfway to anywhere. Uh, so this is an energy map there on the right side. It's an energy map of the inner solar system, er, top areas of interest as far as uh, we are concerned, we in this room are concerned over the rest of this century, namely how much energy it takes to go from lower to Earth to low Earth orbit, from low Earth orbit to other destinations, both in Earth orbit, the Earth moon system, and in the inner solar system. And a fundamental fact, as it happens, of the solar system in which we live is that once you get off Earth, which it, uh, if in, in uh, quantitative terms is characterized as the delta V, the change in velocity that you have to achieve. It's about 9,500 meters per second. I'm an I'm a SI guy, not an English units guy. Uh, I'm a physicist by background. Uh, and that 9,500 meters per second includes uh, gravity losses. It inc includes uh, aerodynamic drag. But once you're in low Earth orbit, anywhere else you want to go in the solar system is about 4,000 meters per second, 3,500, 4,000, 4,500. And this is the secret sauce behind Elon Musk's argument that his starship is going to be able, once it's in low Earth orbit, is with refueling going to be able to go anywhere that it wants. It's going to go to the moon. It's going to go to Mars. So it's about 1,800 meters per second to go down to the lunar surface from lunar orbit, about 4,000 meters per second to go down and back up. It's about 4,000 meters per second to go from Mars orbit to the Mars surface. It's about 4,000 meters per second to go from 
Earth vicinity to Mars vicinity, and so on. So once you've got really low cost access to low Earth orbit from Earth, with refueling, with reusable systems, you can do anything anywhere for double the cost, i.e. you're halfway to anywhere. And this fundamentally changes space. We've seen this now just this past week with uh, SpaceX's launch of the next batch of their, uh, their, their Starlink network. And you've got it coming with OneWeb. You've got several private companies now proposing to deploy networks in space that will fundamentally change access to the internet here on Earth globally and permanently. And uh, this is a, a stack of actual uh, SpaceX uh, Starlink satellites, 60 of them launched the other day. Uh, already in the last six months, a single company has launched the largest network in space, period, ever. Uh, within, by the time they finish the, uh, the planned network, they're looking at 42,000 of these satellites. They will have launched a space object on the or uh, thinking of the system as a single object on the order of a million kilograms and something like 40, 50 megawatts of power. And the reason they're able to do this is because of the, uh, uh, the dramatic cost reduction. If you read uh, from the left to the right, the left is high cost, the right is low cost, and then the cost of the system as a consequence, there's a bunch of assumptions that go underneath these numbers, but as a consequence, what you see is that the cost of this kind of system would have been unimaginable at $15,000 a kilogram, but at $1,500 a kilogram, kilogram, it becomes possible for the right market, and at $200 per kilogram, all sorts of new markets open up and it becomes inevitable. In particular, Another market that's been long anticipated is that of public space travel and tourism. There was a very nice study done uh, 25 years ago called the Commercial Space Transportation Study, uh, oversaw, seen by uh, NASA, a gentleman by the name of Bill Pylon, uh, with uh, uh, team members uh, from uh, Boeing and various other companies, basically posing the question 25 years ago, what would happen to a variety of important markets if the cost of getting into space were drastically reduced. Uh, this particular curve just shows one of the figures from that uh, report, which is available online. If you wanted to get a copy, it's a lot of fun. And what it illustrates is that the cost per pound, these are, these are English units, I apologize, uh, drops below about $10,000 a pound, about $5,000 a kilogram. The number of people who might be expected to go into space as public for space tourism drastically increases, because this is a log-log uh, curve. Uh, the, the black line at the top is the maximum number, the, uh, or is, the, is the minimum number, low probability. The bottom line is the high probability. Uh, and so essentially, when it gets below about $200 a kilogram, uh, it's projected to be anywhere at this time, anywhere from 100 to 100,000 people might go to space at those kinds of price points. That will result in significant new activities in Earth orbit and with in-space refueling and reusable space transportation systems in significant new activities uh, outside of uh, space tourism. No, no, too far. So one that I'm gonna highlight in particular uh, is a topic on which I've spent a fair amount of time and that is uh, space solar power uh, and so I'd like to just illustrate the, uh, the idea. If you're not familiar with it, it has to do with putting up large space systems, harvesting solar energy in space, and then delivering it to terrestrial markets. Uh, several fundamental barriers to space solar power have been the cost of the space system, uh, the cost of the space uh, hardware, uh, specific technologies associated with the assembly and construction, of what would inevitably be extraordinarily large space systems, and then the resulting cost per kilowatt hour for power delivered by those systems and whether or not it could be competitive in the terrestrial marketplace. Uh, so uh, the, the main focus here being that the, uh, the, as the cost of launch comes down, 
the cost contribution to the price of electricity that such a system could deliver becomes extraordinarily tiny, i.e. on the order of this cost of transportation becomes about a penny per kilowatt hour as a contribution to the cost of such systems. And at that point, it really comes down to the uh, cost of the hardware. Cost of launch at these low price points that we're approaching will be completely irrelevant in the cost of electricity which could be delivered. And I'll go back to this figure for just a moment. And I just want to highlight that this is, a, this is the, the Starlink photograph. It's essentially 60 RF, uh, solar-powered RF satellites in a stack launched uh, last spring. Another one was just launched this year. Uh, and I, if I remember, or, or launched uh, last week, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, the vehicle that was used to launch the first package and the second package was the same vehicle. So just reused, if I, if I understood the press accounts properly. There is no fundamental difference between a mass-produced satellite stack and the mass-produced pieces that would go into one of these modular approaches to solar power satellites. Uh, and if you, if I uh, looked at the, I've been looking at the numbers, trying to extract from some of the public filings what I think the prices are for the hardware that the, the costs are for the hardware that SpaceX is launching. My esti estimate is that there are a planned constellation of some tens of thousands of satellites that they're going to be at something like five thousand dollars a kilogram. And that the price of electricity, their, their 40, 50 megawatts that they're going to have uh, within their full system is going to be a, a basic, a very, very comparable with terrestrial energy prices. Now compare that to the cost of space solar power on board the International Space Station. If you run the numbers on the cost of that hardware and the cost of the marching army and all of that, what you end up with is a cost of like $50 a kilowatt hour for about 100 kilowatts. Now, as long as our space systems are limited to kilowatts and to tens to hundreds of dollars per kilowatt hour, very few ambitious things are going to be done in space. However, once one can do megawatts to hundreds of megawatts in space at cents per kilowatt hour, everything we can contemplate doing in Earth orbit and elsewhere in the inner solar system where the sun shines fundamentally changes including the ability to use such platforms for the extraction of resources from the asteroids, uh, for the uh, delivery of power to the lunar surface for operations and for resource development, and then for delivery of power uh, beyond the Earth's vicinity, for example, at Mars. In addition, these technologies and these systems will make possible the develop the deployment and the assembly of extraordinarily huge imaging systems. And it, it's it, this is a picture that I had done oh, 25 years ago. Uh, but if you you should notice the resemblance between these panels, which are being install, installed to form this enormous imaging system, and the panels that made up the Starlink satellite stack that was launched last week. And the only difference between the two is the structural system on which you deploy the pieces, the robotics that you'd have to have to, to uh, do that assembly, uh, and the fact that it's an imager rather than an RF system. So these, these kinds of systems deployable in months or weeks by independent, relatively small actors is well within the technical reach of what's being discussed and what's being done right now because of low cost launch. In addition, the development of the moon, again, at $100 a kilowatt hour, the development of the moon, its resources, the eventual settlement of the moon is all uh, unthinkable. But that is going to rapidly change as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a moon rush going on, if you haven't noticed. T Ten years ago, almost nobody wanted to go to the moon. Today, there are on the order of two, three dozen spacecraft probes, missions, orbiters, CubeSats, landers, rovers, uh, subsurface probes, all on the way to the moon from multiple countries, multiple companies, numerous universities. And they're all going in large measure 
because of the verification that there are in fact ices at the poles of the moon, not as a trivial uh, uh, scientific data point, but as a massive resource, which in combination with the reusable space systems that I described a moment ago, space transportation systems, allows those vehicles to be refueled, not deep in the gravity well using fuel brought from Earth, but high in the gravity well with resources taken from the lunar surface. And so these resources will have uh, application basically in providing transportation throughout cislunar space, the Earth-Moon system, as well as destinations beyond at prices of $1,000 a kilogram rather than a million dollars a kilogram, which we have grown accustomed to as a transportation cost to put something on the moon or to put something on Mars. And a three order of magnitude transformation change in cost in less than a decade uh, will, will simply change everything that we can do in all of these places. And I've got here another one of my little, little curves. It basically just uh, shows that the, uh, the, the Earth to orbit contribution to the cost of putting 10,000 kilograms, 10 tons on the surface of the moon, once you get below the Falcon 9 reusable price points, that it just becomes vanishingly small. So we go from a Saturn V kind of scenario with billions of dollars per person on the moon to the future, which will be hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars per person on the moon, i.e. a three order of magnitude reduction in that cost with reusable space transportation and reusable uh, and uh, refueling in space. So I wanna just close with a highlight and bring it around to the, uh, in particular, to the uh, US uh, and uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, space context and highlight a particular aspect of space solar power and its potential impact on an entire region. So one topic that I've been spending a fair amount of time on is actually the potential application. I need to actually get you to the, uh, to the correct slide, sorry. Uh, the potential impact of this on Indo-Pacific uh, dynamics. So if one were to develop a solar power satellite and to place it uh, in a geostationary Earth orbit uh, at a location uh, above the equator, so uh, aligned with uh, the, the middle point of the outback of Australia, uh, the outer circle that you can see here is essentially the addressable Earth from that satellite in geostationary Earth orbit. So everywhere below that, in that circle, could get power from that satellite. Not at the same time, but the power from that satellite could be sent to any of these, any location within that circle. And as a consequence, there is a unique opportunity for a, 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 a partnership between Australia and the US and Japan to develop a solar power satellite system to deliver power initially to Australia, where there are unique market opportunities because of the very large scale mining activities in Australia that are extremely remote from uh, uh, the power grid or from other energy sources, which could then grow into power with several satellites that could be delivered uh, continuously independent solar energy, completely green, uh, for uh, uh, markets throughout the Asia Pacific region, region and to do so at prices on the order of uh, five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and as I said, uh, without regard to the, uh, to the vagaries of weather. So this kind of capability, one would have an immense uh, benefit to the relationship among uh, uh, Australia, the US, New Zealand, uh, Japan, uh, also, you'll notice off over there to the right, also India. Uh, if you put the satellite just a little bit further to the, to the, uh, to the west, uh, you get a much better coverage of India. Uh, so a single, a single satellite or set of satellites could deliver power throughout that region uh, and uh, make possible the sustainable economic development, further economic development uh, for approximately 40% uh, uh, of the world's population. That will be the kind of power 
that will come from the revolution in space. So thank you very much. All right, so trying to bridge that amazing vision from that vision to policy, thinking about what are the opportunities for cooperating with other democracies in the Indo-Pacific. So what was not in John's uh, discussion, but in the context of great power competition, it's important to realize that we have a competitor that is intent on supplanting us as the primary space power by 2045 as an announced goal and that they see the same vision that John has laid out for a lunar industrial civilization with space solar power that will be delivering on the order of $10 trillion annually in the 2050 timeframe. It's very tempting when we start to think about cooperation to get limited into the previous discussions that were entirely about exploration. And one of the things that I hope John's comments have done is to break you out of the thought that it's about exploration and science. Fundamentally, the future in space is about exploitation, economic development at a massive scale. And so that needs to be not a part, but the absolute center of our thinking on policy. It's also very common for us to think in a narrow statist sense about launch, to focus on our launch vehicle that, our, that NASA's building versus theirs and to miss this larger and incredible transformation that is happening in the commercial sector, currently led by the United States, but with an extreme set of fast followers with somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 launch companies worldwide, all or at least half of which appear to be trying to go after reusable launch. And, and that's going to be, as John told you, utterly transformational to what we can have as ambitions in space. So, as John said, we're going to have entirely new concepts. And the center concept that should be concerning all of us is space solar power, because it has the ability to completely alter everything about global dynamics and energy and scale. And that's the thing, right? Talking about scale and significant markets. That should completely alter you know, what is the center of our thinking about cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. In the many trillion dollar space economy that is unfolding, what do we want as a nation and as a set of nations from this new frontier, and how do we wish to author that century ahead? So the United States has a number of very important interests in space. Some are specific to space and some are space enabled. But I would say that the thing that benefits us the most in terms of the sorts of values that we would hope to impart to the future, the, the values of freedom and liberty for individual human beings is, is power. It's the global primacy that we have available to us and the ability to use space to advertise our values for emulation and collective action. The other things are very specific, but it is what space does for everything that should matter the most. So what we need to be thinking about is to build an entire ecosystem where the United States supplies certain things that enables everyone else to plug in. So we need a shaping strategy to maintain that balance of power in favor of democracy and liberty. We need a shaping vision, a vision that's noble, that attracts the uncommitted, that undermines those who would oppose us. And we need a shaping platform of what we want to do and show where others can plug into that ecosystem. So the strategy, I would say, we need to be betting on our fellow democracies and the resources of space to build a much brighter future for humanity. The vision should be a multi-trillion dollars of wealth and green energy to empower a fully developed society of human liberty. And the shaping platform needs to be an end-to-end -end reusable transportation system that enables that third industrial revolution. So within that, what is the role of the United States and how do we build space for our partners and allies? At the bottom, the roots are that cis-lunar space access 
and then the cooperative institutions and financial institutions that enable access to capital in the specific domain. At the top, it's providing that top shelter for freedom of commerce as we do on the high seas via United States Space Force. And in the middle is everything else that both the commercial sector and our partners can supply in this vast space in between. If you look at what underwrote US primacy, our, the global economy, our partner security, and the overall regime that favors international security and individual liberty, we built a series of institutions post-World War II that enabled that to happen. And we will need to build a new set of institutions specific to the space domain similar to this, similar to the standards that OECD made, similar to the sorts of uh, alliance relationships that we had with NATO and Japan, and similar to the sorts of policing functions that we did with the Navy and with the Air Force. So there are obvious places to start with the four big major partners, and then the peripheral partners that are getting into the space domain there. We should be focusing on the nexus of where all these things come together. And so at the nexus of liberty, democracy, security, and economy, we have institution design and cooperation. We have space mining, space solar power, asteroid defense, and of course, specific to security, defense among space agencies. I think it's appropriate that Hudson takes this on. Uh, many of you may not know, but in 1977, there was this extremely prescient work by Herman Kahn himself written for NASA that was restricted and, and not allowed into the public until a few years ago. And it is, it's very consistent with the future that John laid out, but written 42 years ago. And then just out is a fantastic report by thinkers at Air Force Space Command that lays out very different visions for the future and where we would or wouldn't go. And I encourage all of you to look at that in terms of background for this broader space industrial future that we are talking about. But in thinking about key directions for policy, we need to create a broad system of norms and institutions to grow commerce and activity in the space domain that needs to not have exploration as the center word. It needs to have development or industrialization as the center word. It needs to focus on scale. We need to be thinking about uh, bilateral recognition of claims with other democracies we need to be willing to shoulder the burden of protection via US Space Force and to provide domestic leadership in terms of vision, the technology investment in those industrial space technologies, and then legislative frameworks in the manner that we would hope others to copy. And of course, centerpiece is we have to make sure that we are investing in the logistics system that will enable all of that. So I'll leave you with this thought that the best way of thinking about space in terms of an analogy is thinking about it as analogous to the maritime domain. Hey, as as I uh, as I joined Hudson as a Japan chair, which is a great honor for me, you know, uh, Dr. Weinstein told me that there would be no math. So, I mean, <laughs> but but uh, but thanks, John. It was it was so clear. I could even a historian could follow it. Uh, we're we're really here at a critical moment. I think all of us realize it's a time of tremendous change, tremendous change in the space domain, with tremendous implications for us geostrategically, you know, here here on Earth. And there's no better place than to have this discussion than at Hudson, a place that is committed and a team that is committed to a secure 
free and prosperous future. The space domain and the competitions that are now ongoing in the space domain have tremendous implications for that future. And we have a tremendous panel to help give us insights into what are these emerging challenges and what can we do together, together across our free and open societies to guarantee the future that is part of, of Hudson's, Hudson's mission statement. We heard already just today some significant changes that are, that are happening. We thought that space would be uncontested and we would have really relative freedom there, but we know it's contested now. And as Peter just told us, I think there's a very useful analogy in connection with the maritime domain and what closed authoritarian uh, countries, China in particular, are doing to restrict movement there. I think it's certainly not unreasonable to assume, and we know actually that China is taking actions now to, to restrict our freedom and access to the space domain as well. The, the public and versus private, you know, the, 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 really it's been government that has dominated operations and, and capabilities in space. And the, just the explosion in the private sector, and what John said it was really just a few years ago, almost unpredictable uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the scale. And then, of course, as, as John has mentioned today, you know, the, the decreasing cost, the, the increasing number of players, the increasing number of systems. So we have, we have a great panel to help us understand better what are the nature of these competitions and what can we do? What can we do across the free and open Indo-Pacific to ensure that, that we do secure that future that's secure, free, and, and, and prosperous? We have with us four tremendous panelists. First will be Lieutenant General Retired Stephen Quast, who is a li who spent a lifetime uh, studying space and its implications. Uh, he, is, he has helped develop, I think, our strategic vision uh, for, for space and has ensured, I think, that help us ensure that we can maintain our competitive advantages in space. He's been the president of Air University, and he's been really critical to developing the Space Force, not just in terms of the hard capabilities, but the people capabilities. And he's been an educator of those that are really defending our freedom and, and our ability to operate uh, freely in, in, in space every, every day. Then we have Nisashi Murano, who we're so privileged to have as, as our Japan chair, helping us understand better how to make what was Prime Minister Abe's vision years ago of a free and open Indo-Pacific a, a reality. And today, of course, Hudson, I think, is on the cutting edge of, of that understanding by including space, understanding the competitions there, and implications for that free and open Indo-Pacific. Dr. Namrata uh, Gosnami is an author and an analyst uh, who is a thought leader on a broad range of security issues uh, in India and internationally. And now she and her consultancy are working on what is, what is the nature of great power competition in space, what are its implications, and she'll help us understand what India's space priorities are so that, so that India can help advance and, and protect its interests in space uh, as, as well. And then, and then finally, we have Richard Lawless. I think I'll ask you to kind of clean up on the, on the initial opening comments. And he's the perfect person to give us a, a perspective of a career intelligence uh, officer uh, with tremendous experience across the Indo-Pacific as well. And so he understands the capabilities uh, that, that are now in space, the contested domain of space, as well as, as implications for, for regional security uh, cooperation across across the Indo-Pacific, and he has extensive experience in, in the area of nuclear nonproliferation uh, and regional security. So, welcome to all of you. Please join me in giving them a round of applause to welcome them here to Hudson. And Steve, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. We'll have some opening comments, and then we'll have a discussion uh, among among us. And and uh, Steve, thanks for kicking it off. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for taking the time to be here. And uh, as uh, Peter Gerritsen pointed out earlier this morning, but I think it's worth reiterating, it's nice to see such young faces in the audience, because this is really a <laughs> journey for the next generation. And I'm glad that you are all so young and vibrant and creative. Uh, we always say that if a group doesn't have anybody under the age of 30, there's no creativity in the room. So I'm glad you're all under the age of 30. Good job. <laughs> Um, I, I would say, you know, as we focus on Indo-Pacific, uh, it, it's uh, worthy of just stepping back one more step and realizing that as the human race started discovering technology and how technology could change their life, 
the things they need, shelter, food, a sense of belonging, and a sense of securing that, uh, that food and shelter. Um, the, um, the, uh, you would invent a ship, and the ship would uh, sail across the oceans, and it would uh, open up new marketplaces. Uh, and geography shaped culture, it shaped civilizations, and then the ship changed that a little bit. Geography was not as profoundly restrictive to a tribe or a culture uh, to connect and interconnect. And then the airplane, and oh my word, how that changed geography again, which clashes against our culture, and it opened up a whole new highway to new marketplaces with a temporal dimension of speed and range. Space, I would argue, uh, is going to make geography irrelevant to some degree because of the global nature that space can range with speed to any point on planet Earth and then the solar system. And so we all get stuck as a culture into the paradigms of the past. And we're stuck in this culture of spaces, putting somebody on the moon and uh, satellites that give us GPS and, and uh, imagery. And we forget sometimes how profoundly this will change the human condition and our ability to potentially uplift the human condition or denigrate the human condition depending on how we manage it. So as a national security uh, professional, just like you are, our ultimate job is not to fight wars. It is to be peacemakers because we design such clever strategies that nobody would ever contest it. And whenever there's a new marketplace, whenever there is new resources, if there is not a, a joining journey of predictability and uh, the ability to hold people to a rule of law and to an, a set of agreements between different civilizations that have different values, if you don't have that component of predictability and security, violence will ensure, ensue. And it's not because we want violence, but it's because the human condition has historically proven that somebody will act with evil intent. Somebody will steal what good men and women have built if there is not some sense of security. That's intuitive to most human beings, most civilizations. And that is the whole purpose for our government. So my view on space is uh, broader than just Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific gives us all of the realities of speed and range. But ultimately, if we as countries that believe in common values of respect for all other human beings and hard work and this sense that you have an individual responsibility to contribute to the team, to the, the tribe, to the culture that you belong to, that if we collectively come together and focus on some of the fundamentals of this new environment, we can build it but we are trapped. So think about the four industries that space will transform and think about it in the Indo-Pacific region with the speed and range required. Transportation, we've talked about. Peter Gerritsen discussed that, so did John. Um, but it's gonna be energy. John talked about that. It's gonna be um, not just energy and, uh, and uh, transportation, but information. Look at the satellites that Elon Musk is throwing up, where you're going to have Wi-Fi from space. Soon, you'll not just have Wi-Fi from space, but you'll be able to trickle charge your phone from space, and you never have to plug it into a wall. You can see how this starts transforming. But right now, I would argue that our Congress and our countries are going into space like a bunch of kids on a soccer field all chasing the ball. Okay, And we're building stuff. We're building satellites. We're building this to do uh, information. We're doing this to build transportation. And we are, we are not keeping up with China's larger view of what they are doing. And what they're doing is what we did when we built a Navy in America, or we built an aerospace industry in America. We didn't build a Navy because we liked ships. We built a Navy and a merchant marine and a shipbuilding industry because we knew the economy of the global commerce on the open oceans would change world commerce. It would uplift all civilizations. And so we, we invested in the, in the foundation. We went from wooden ships and sails to iron ships, steam, and coal. And that was hard. 
for our culture to change. Because man, those people that built wooden ships and sails, they were good. They had a whole industry. We did the same with mechanization. Boy, we had a whole industry of horses and horse feeders, horse stalls, horse breeders for an army full of horses. And when mechanization came in, that was disruptive to change everything. Aerospace. When the airplane first came about, America kind of ignored it until the Brits and the French started showing what the airplane could do. And then the government got involved with Pan American, and we built an aerospace industry. That has not yet happened in space. Yet space is going to trans transform more than the Navy was able to transform, or an Air Force was able to transform by blending economics with national security, because space will dominate transportation, information, energy, and manufacturing, and be able to deliver it to any point on planet Earth at pennies on the dollar of what you can do using a terrestrial model. Space has the network power that we haven't even tapped into. So as countries in the Indo-Pacific, if we partner on the foundation, not the low-hanging fruit of this satellite, that satellite, or putting somebody on the moon, that's not what I'm talking about. The foundations of transportation, energy, building an ecosystem in cislunar space that gets after the ability to maneuver faster than any other competition, to be able to communicate more rapidly and more cleverly and than your competition, and to be able to bring power to bear so that if somebody behaves badly or inconsistent with our values, we can hold them accountable. If thugs, thieves, and pirates start stealing what good women and men build in space. There is some entity that brings justice to bear. If we don't focus on that first, China will be able to outmaneuver all of us. And we will find ourselves like a nation that sees somebody else building a navy, an air force, and the Panama Canal. And we continue refining how well we build the horse. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Sasha, I was going to ask you to, to maybe to, for your comments, and, and I imagine you're going to share with us what are Japan's priorities in space as well. Yes, so thank you very much. So, uh, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. The, uh, my name is Masashi Murano. The, I'm responsible for the uh, US Japan uh, Defense Cooperation Program as the Japan Chair Fellow. So and the, my original the specific field is the, the deterrence strategy and policy. So from today, I'd like to talk about the Japan's space security policy from that perspective and uh, how do we deal with the great power competition between uh, uh, US and China. So let me start the, uh, as a initial remarks, the, let me start the comparing with the situation of the United States, the, the history of the space development of the United States. Uh, in Japan's history of the space development and its application is very different. Uh, history of the U.S. The space development uh, was the four decades linkage to the strategic competition between U.S. and Soviet unions. The, while the, we, as we know that uh, while nuclear war did not break out, but those the technologies that developed during that period, for instance, the early warning sensors and precision guided munitions that were applied to the scud hunting at the Operation Desert Storm. Uh, these capabilities becoming the foundation for the, the uh, tactical war fighting uh, in this realm uh, for, by the United, United States force since the first Gulf War. But on the other hand, the Japan's space development and the operations has been conceptualizing the, in a different way. The, uh, we have, uh, our space policy has been the, led by the next Ministry of the, uh, uh, Education, Science, and Technologies, and JAXA, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agencies, not, but not the Ministry of Defense and Self-Defense Forces. For Japan, its peace, uh, peace constitution and uh, uh, a strong public consensus that for the pacifism have created an aversion to link defense issues to space development. So in that sense, the Japan, Japanese have tended to view the space as the positive futuristic frontier uh, for exploration and te or technological development rather than conceptualizing it from the national security standpoint. 
However, uh, Japan's the latest national defense program guideline, which is, is the capstone document of the, our defense strategy, it's re reviewed the end, end of the last year. It's the position of the space domain as an important area of the defense investment along with cyber and electro electromagnetic spectrum. So Japan made such a decision not only because of the current United States efforts under the Trump administration, but also concerns about China's rapidly developing the counter space capabilities. So these capabilities include not only kinetic assets, uh, such a, which tested in the t 2007, uh, but also non-kinetic counter space systems, such as the laser dazzling the, uh, against optical sensors, the, and uplink and downlink jamming. So in particular, the characteristics of the non-kinetic counter space capabilities will complicate our, our escalation control. So for instance, the first, the, even if it used that it cannot be recognized by humans, uh, basically. And second, in the current space situational awareness capabilities, it's difficult to recognize in the real time the whether a problem with the satellite systems are intentional or accidental. With the third characteristic in the space, it's difficult to identify the attacker's attribution in real time with some exceptions. And the fourth characteristics is reversibility. In other words, if some jamming attack that stops, the satellite function may be restored. And fifth, these technologies have already proliferated and readily available. So in that, these factors mean that difficulty to deterrence by punishment. So in other words, the lack of the situa space situational awareness and its ambiguity created some gray zone situation that is likely occurred. The furthermore, the, let me think about that the, our satellite systems was hit by the China or some another uh, opponent satellite in the peacetime. So in that, in that situation, can we immediately uh, recognize whether it, act, it is accident, accidental or intentional? So if so, so more specific situation. If China apologized, it was just an accident. What is the, our appropriate, appropriate response? So that this, this situation is very difficult for the, our decision making to delay the, our, some appropriate decision making to based on the, the caused by the ambiguity of the space situation or awareness. And the reversible counter space capabilities such as the jamming that have a lower threshold for use and hard to deter the reversible attacks, in irreversible attacks. So therefore, it is important to not only the strengthening our resiliency of the space systems, but also have our offensive and defensive space counter, spa counter space capabilities for escalation control. So therefore, in the, the latest version, in uh, 2018 version of the National Defense Program Guideline, Japan decided to uh, research and study of disruptive measures on opponents, the C4I, in collaboration with uh, electromagnetic domains. And moreover, the most likely targeting targets of the jamming for the positioning signals and the communication signals and image information acquired by the synthetic aperture later. So for this reason, the Japan's the, uh, space security policy priorities as follows. The first is to improve then the space situational awareness capabilities. The, according to the current program, the Ministry of Defense and JAXA uh, working together to build opt optical and radar observation facilities. Uh, uh, they plan to build and the space situational awareness systems by the fiscal year 2022. Uh, in addition, the Ministry of Defense will aggregate the SSA information in Japan and share it in the Combined Space Operations Center with the United States, which has a global SSA network. So, and the second is to improve the resiliency and the confidentiality of the communication satellites. And third is ensure the resiliency of the, our positioning signal and force the capability to intelligence, including the early warning and the maritime domain awareness, should be improved. 
Uh, in this area, the Ministry of Defense plans to start the demonstration of the satellite integrated dual band infrared sensors in 2020, in the next year. So this is the uh, initial study of the space-based early warning sensor of Japan. So, and finally, I'd like to point out some policy recommendation so for the further cooperation between allies. The first, in the multi-domain strategic competitions, so we must identify our advantages and disadvantages and compete with China in the favorable domain uh, we, uh, where we have advantages. So I think that our uh, advantages is, the, one of our advantages is the alliance networks. So in that context, the last year, Vice President Pence and Prime Minister Abe agreed to implement the whole state payload program as a new area of the cooperation between Japan and, and the United States. At this, at this plan, uh, in 2023, uh, in the US SSA sensor will be installed of the Japanese positioning satellites. And I think that hosted payload could complicate the deterrence calculation and increase the threshold at which the, our potential adversaries could use the counter space capabilities. Uh, for instance, that if China were to launch an attack on our satellite systems in the Taiwan crisis scenario, if it was equipped with the Australian or NATO's mission module in the same, same uh, satellite module. So another example is in the Baltic, Baltic invasion scenario by the Russia. If the NATO satellite was equipped to Japan's mission module or US mission module, an attack of, of them would cause by the horizontal escalations. So I think that this is a cross regional deterrent effect and the political, increasing the political, resilien political resilience. Uh, in other words, not only Japan and the United States, but also uh, Japan, Australia, Japan, NATO, or Japan, US, NATO, and US, Australia and other countries like uh, India should be considered to the, as a possible co combination for the four-state payload program. And moreover, China does not have the alliance network like ours, and it's trying to develop their satellite systems. This is both their, their advantages and weakness, which means that if we needed to get space control, uh, we can attack the Chinese satellite system without worrying about the horizontal escalation at least at this moment. So, and second point is that today's joint operation needed to the need to be brought need to be sought uh, of the connecting all domains in the actual war fighting situation, as well as the intelligence analysis in the peacetime. Uh, if we focus on the one phenomena that occurs the single domain. We may overlook the fact that small phenomena work with another behavior with another domains. So therefore, that before the multi-domain operations, I think that more the multi-domain intelligence analysis is more important. In this point, I think that we should pay attention to the strategic collaboration between the China and China and Russia. So last July, the China and Russian strategic bomber jointly flew the nearby the Takeshima, where is the distribute, disputed territory between the Japan and the South Korea, and Senkaku Island. Uh, that I think that that action was a classic probing into Japan would work with the United States and the South Korea in politically sensitive area, and in addition to that, it it also aimed to provoke the further friction between the China Japan and South Korea, which have been deteriorating, and to promote further decoupling between two countries. So we should consider to the pro, uh, possibility that strategic collaboration between the China and Russia and extended to the space domain, which means that if China and Russia implemented to the whole state payload like us, uh, our strategic calculation will be more complex. Uh, so let me stop here. Thank you, Mr. Rana. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kosnavi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Master. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I think I got the... Uh, it's
it's, a, it's my pleasure to be here today, and I think I got the Arctic chill from Alabama to <laughs> D.C. <laughs> so um, in terms of the topic that has been given to me, uh, I was asked to talk about a bit about India's and the U.S. Uh, space cooperation, and, so, uh, and also what are the future avenues that are possible in terms of this domain. So what I thought would be useful is to see what space means in, in general terms and also for India in terms of its strategic uh, outlook. So I would argue that Spain is, space is one of the most important factors in how a nation uh, articulates its grand strategy and also in terms of its comprehensive national power. And so it's useful to put it within that particular framework and not look at it as a domain by itself. So in that context, I argue that the Apollo era of flags and footprints, where you go to space, show off a particular technology, and then come back to Earth, has changed. So today, we are actually in the Chang'er era of permanent presence. So if you look at China's conceptualization of space and their space goals in the next 20, 30 years, they argue that their goal is to establish a permanent sustainable presence on the lunar surface and dominate cislunar, which is what was mentioned by John and by Peter and General Quast as the most important domain. So in that context, where the discourse about space has changed, since December 2018. I argue that space cooperation between democracies like the United States and India takes a particular significant role. Now, in terms of strategic background, just a bit of history. So India, as you know, has histori historically been non-aligned and did not want to have any kind of alignment with any great power, especially in the Cold War. But today, that context has changed. And that change happened when President Bill Clinton visited India in 2000, followed by one of the most landmark agreements between the India and the US, as you know, and that's the civil nuclear deal. So I remember being in India and how important that was in terms of the change in strategic outlook for India's uh, political regime. Now, in that context, some of the agreements that I think will be useful to understand where India-US space cooperation could go is one is the next step in strategic partnership, which was signed in 2004, looking at a long-term 10-year relationship between India and the US in the defense sector, which was uh, renewed in 2015. The second framework which I think is important is the 2012 Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, which fosters for sophisticated science and technology cooperation. And mind you, this is very important from the Indian perspective, all, all while ensuring that bureaucratic processes and procedures do not stand in the way of cooperation. And so that's important that they outline that important process step. I would argue that for space, what India and the US would require is a similar vision as we saw in 2015, and that's the vision for the Asia Pacific. This was game changing for India. As you know, India historically has been non-aligned, has shied away from making statements that would be seen as adversarial from China. But if you look at the joint vision of the Asia Pacific, it was very clearly stated between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi that freedom of navigation in the South China Sea is one of the priority. And so you can see from that particular statement that the strategic context has changed. Now, under the Trump administration, I think one of the factors which has come out very clearly is that India is seen as a key strategic partner. There are several military logistical agreements that are in place and are going to be signed. Uh, one example is, of course, uh, the uh, Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, the very basic foundational agreement between the militaries. And so I point that out, not because I've forgotten space, but because such foundational agreements strategically create the environment for a deeper India-US space cooperation, including in the military sphere. Now, I don't know how many of you actually witnessed the Howdy Modi event which happened, where President Trump was present, and so was the leader of the House majority. For instance, the Democratic uh, leader was present. And so in that particular uh, meeting, it's very interesting. So President Trump mentioned that here in America, we are creating the United States Space Force, and we are working closely with India to enhance space cooperation. We will pioneer new frontiers in space, working together, raising the sides of humanity. We will uphold our values, defend our liberty, and control our destiny. Very similar to what Peter and General Quas talked about. 
So uh, based on this particular framework, I'm going to come to space now. So for instance, India-US space cooperation is not new. In the 1970s, the Indian Space Research Organization and NASA conducted the satellite inst inst institutional television experiment utilizing NASA's first direct broadcasting satellite. And based on that, actually, ISRO uh, developed its own Indian national satellite that enabled my family, who did not have television access, in a very remote area in northeast India to have access. And people don't forget that, that kind of cooperation that enabled India's uh, ability to be able to see television. And in fact, what is so fascinating is that most of these satellites at that time were launched on US launch systems which people don't realize. So addition to liberty, freedom, freedom of press, information. Now, uh, coming to India's strategic culture, I hear a lot of complaints when I was here in DC as a USIP senior fellow, 2012, 2013, that India's strategic culture is very non-committal in terms of building alliances or working closely with the United States. So I argue that there are four different strategic cultures in India. The, in the 1950s and 60s, it was the Nehruvian strategic culture determined by India's first prime minister, which was against any kind of great power alliance. And that's where the non-alignment movement started. Nehru's fear was that if India joins any kind of alliance system at that time, India would lose its place in the world. The second strategic culture is, of course, Gandhian. So Gandhi does not believe in the modern state system. He argues that we need to focus on very communitarian approaches. India also has the Marxian approach, which looks at any investment in space as countering or contradictory to India's hope for poverty alleviation. And so Indian space research organizations, Mars Orbiter, for instance, was very heavily criticized within India for its expense. Today, actually, is a fascinating context to look at India-US space cooperation. So the context of today's strategic culture is not neoliberal, as Manmohan Singh was, open economy, global institutional structures, but more realist, I would argue. So if you see how the Narendra Modi government is functioning, it's based on accumulating economic and military power, and it's also hyper-nationalist. So it's India first. So it's a combination of both, not very different from what President Trump is articulating. And actually, both of them, when they had their conversation, indicated to that particular potential. In that context, Modi has actually highlighted the importance of India-US space cooperation. And in that context, I would identify eight future areas that can be looked into in terms of US-India joint space cooperation. One is that I would argue that the United States and India can sign a shared vision of industrial space development and security of commerce. This vision should be explored through a diversity of tabletop exercises involving representatives from NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization, the US Space Force, and as you know, India has constituted a very, very new uh, Indian Defense Space Agency looking at space from a military perspective. Again, a great shift in India's strategic culture, where there was a shyness to argue for military space. So, the, so what I would argue is that in that particular tabletop uh, exercise, it's very important to have a consensus on broad global regimes governing economic development of space, which is the focus of both countries today. The second issue that there could be cooperation is space situational awareness. So I would argue that signed agreements between the United States Space Command and the newly established Indian Defense Space Agency for space situational awareness, this must be followed by exchange of space personnel at the highest levels of strategy and public policy for military space, space intelligence, civil space agencies. And this I say in the context that such cooperation is missing today. We actually don't have that level of cooperation. So that could be an area of focus. And uh, this sort of mechanism will allow easier cooperative planning and make it easier to harmonize legislation, investment, and mutual activities. The third important uh, area of cooperation could be to establish a joint vision for Earth observation, environmental surveillance, remote sensing broadband, and maritime domain awareness, especially in the region we are talking about, the Indo-Pacific. And this can be actually built upon the already existing frameworks like the India-US nuclear agreement and the 10-year US-India defense framework agreement. And what is very interesting, and this is something that needs to be highlighted, is that when you look at the India-US uh, defense framework or the next step in strategic partnership, it's already identified that India and the US should work 
to build space cooperation. So you already have the frameworks in existence. It's already passed through the bureaucratic hurdles and has been signed. So you have the frameworks, you just need to develop more deeper detail uh, cooperation possibility. The fourth area of cooperation could be joint robotic mission to the moon. As you know, in 2008, Chandrayaan-1 carried NASA's moon mineralogy mapper, which discovered water ice and actually provided us the first mineralogical map of the moon. You know that this year, India tried to land very close to the South Pole and failed in the very last seconds. And that was a big disappointment for Modi and the Indian Space Research Organization. So I would argue that given NASA's capability in that domain, this is a great area for cooperation. And again, it already is signed between both the countries to have that kind of moon cooperation. So uh, as we know, NASA just recently announced that it is planning to send a robotic rover to the moon by 2022 to prospect for ice. Guess which two other countries have a similar cooperation? India and Japan. So India and Japan just signed an agreement in which they are both going to send a resource prospector to the moon by the same date. So I would argue that this is a great area where you can cooperate, a trilateral cooperation possibly, between India, Japan, and the United States. The other fifth area of cooperation is the joint exploration of Mars. As we know, in September 2014, NASA's MAVEN and India's Mangalyan actually arrived at the Martian surface very close to each other, just four days. And it's fascinating that and not known that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that does contract work for NASA through Caltech actually provided the navigation and communication support for the Mars Orbiter mission for India. So that's a great area to cooperate given that both countries are focused on Mars exploration and development to an extent. And what is interesting is that the working group for Mars already exists between India and the US. So all that is need to be done is to work within that group and look towards Mars in the next 20, 30 years. The sixth area of cooperation could be within the NISAR, that is the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar Project, which aims to actually send up a joint satellite through India's geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle in 2021. Now, this is very interesting, this kind of developments, because this particular mission will improve scientists' understanding of climate change and natural hazard, and plans to have one of the best imaging of the Earth's surface. So you can see that there is also the context of scientific cooperation. Now, coming to space, nuclear propulsion, and technology. We know that China has already announced a goal to establish nuclear propulsion technology by 2040. So if you look at China Academy of Space Technology, their mapping is that the importance of nuclear powered space shuttle is because it will enable you to go faster to the Mars and also enable asteroid exploration. If you look at their white paper, they've been talking about it. And so already establish a program. So within that context, given that India, like the United States, has significant expertise in small nuclear reactors, this is a great area to cooperate between the US and India in the long term. The final area of cooperation, I would argue, is what John Mankins and Peter talked about, and that is orbital power stations. As remarked by President Trump, energy security is, is at the heart of US-India relationship. Already, China has started a program to build solar power satellites, a technology that could alter the entire balance of global power. They established it this year in Chongqing and it is fu it's, uh, funded up to the tune of $30 million. So I would argue that one of the visionaries of India, who's the former president, Abdul Kalam, actually was the first head of state to talk about space-based solar power. And he urged that India and the US should actually not miss the opportunity to cooperate in this area of technology that's going to be so beneficial to uh, their citizens. So that's an area of cooperation that I can think of. Finally, the way forward. I would argue that to identify space as a key area of strategic cooperation based on a shared vision is extremely important. I haven't seen that vision yet. You see a lot of speeches, you see a lot of bureaucratic coming together, but I don't see that shared vision of what should be the focus of India US space cooperation today. Maybe Hudson can actually publish a report based on such a common vision. <laughs> Second, utilize the framework uh, that already exists, like the next step in strategic partnership, the defense frameworks that are getting much closer to enable such cooperation. I would argue that it's really significant to establish joint military threat perceptions. 
which do not exist. We talked about interoperability. You, you talk about it, but if you look at the existing structures, for instance, the Pentagon or NASA, you do not find Indian military officers present there. So unless you have that kind of deep detail cooperation, it's not easy to come to a common threat perception. Built, and this is extremely important, since I worked at the Indian Institute of Defense Studies for 10 years, one of the beef that was mentioned, and you should really know this, is that Indians thought that whenever the Americans approach the Indians, the relationship is very transactional. So what do I have and what do you have to offer? I would argue that we should work towards building a transformational relationship based on what is the goal that we both countries want to go for. And I think that it's a difference. It's about building a relationship. There'll be frustrations. But as you know, India's bureaucratic and organizational culture is very different from the United States. And this is a point I cannot harbor more. And that is just because both countries are democracies, their strategic organizational cultures are not similar. You have a presidential system. India has a parliamentary system. If you see the problems the former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had, to pass the Indian and the US civil nuclear deal is amazing, that kind of opposition that was there from the bureaucracy. So I would argue, I would end by arguing that today's context is that you have a government in India under Prime Minister Modi, which has a unique advantage, and that is he has majority in the lower house of parliament, which is very important for passing legislation, and is going to have majority in the upper house by next year, depending on the states that are going to be represented. So in this context, to forward a US-India space relationship based on a common vision for space industrial development is not going to be difficult for him to get through in his legislature, unlike the US-India nuclear deal. So the time is now. You cannot wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gosnavi. And then, and then, Richard, if you'd wrap this up for us in terms of the opening comments, and, and, uh, and then I have a few questions for, for all of you. Thank, Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to begin by referencing Peter's, uh, one of the diagrams that was projected today, and it showed the um, five or six necessary columns, or pillars, if you will, of the structure that we're going to have to have to develop and deploy and compete the way we need to compete in, in space. And with that regard, a lot of the discussion today has uh, touched upon other players in the region, but certainly it's come down to, with due respect to India, the fact that we're really focused on the rise of China and China's policies. And in that context, what I'd like to do is look a little bit at um, what I think uh, has to be done with regard to Japan. And my perspective is one of not only an intelligence collection perspective, but more importantly as a policy perspective, particularly in the last decade or so. And I think um, I will recall that uh, for those of you in the audience that are under 30 or at 30, 35 years ago when I arrived at uh, the U.S. Embassy in uh, Tokyo and was the science and technology attache, I had two portfolios. One was nuclear energy, and uh, the other was the Japanese space program. And at that time, we regarded Japan as a near-peer competitor, and a lot of attention was focused on where was Japan going with its technology, or was it going not in semiconductors, but in every single field that was judged to be in competition with the United States. Well, quite obviously, times have changed. And so what I'd like to do is very briefly recap today where, again, from an American perspective where I think um, Japan has been in national space policy, where it is now, and where it must go to remain relevant. And relevance in the sense of not only the alliance between the U.S. and Japan, but relevant in the context of just Japan's national interests. So with that, let me just remark that I think looking back over the 50-year history of, uh, until very recently, Japan's space policy, um, there are a number of key points. I think cooperation, above all, among the various ministries, the siloed ministries, Ministry of Education, METI, METI, the private sector, was exceptional in Japan. Second, goals were set, priorities were established, budget issues were resolved consistently, there were setbacks. The setbacks were absorbed and mastered by Japan. It was a record of success, albeit in a research and development oriented program set uh, that is extremely respectful. And I think um, just yesterday, or at least within the last 24 hours, and my Japanese colleagues may correct me here, but I believe 
a manifestation of that um, focus on quality. Uh, the Hayabusa 2 uh, spacecraft lifted off an asteroid about 16 hours ago and has begun its return to the, to the world, an 800 million kilometer journey that will end next November, December, I believe, and deposit a container onto a desert in Australia with samples from that asteroid. It's a major achievement. Of course, we'll see what happens in November. But this, to me, underlines the ability of Japan to drill down and focus and develop a spacecraft and a system uh, that is uh, successful. There is incredible potential there. So where are we now and where are we going? I think in Japan we have reached an, a very important point of inflection. That point of inflection it could be characterized by the fact that as we meet here today, there is a team assembled under the Cabinet Office that is writing the next space policy plan. This is a plan that is issued every five years. It essentially updates a 10-year to 20-year uh, program for Japan space development. And the evolution of that plan began with the last plan five years ago, but this plan is going to be very important. We'll probably see it in draft in about January, and it will be reviewed and approved by the Cabinet Office, heavy hand of the Prime Minister Abe, certainly by next February so that it can be in operation and begin establishing priorities and programs in JFY 2020, which means 1 April 2020. I think we need to be focused on that because we need to, we need to appreciate what's going into it, but that plan, as it's articulated and overviews the entire range of everything related to space policy development in Japan, is going to indicate the tempo the degree of prioritization that Japan as a nation is assigning to space. And one subset of that, of course, will be the degree to which the United States and Japan are cooperating and have found common areas to cooperate. I would suggest that um, the evolution of this plan, uh, as it has evolved in the last five years, but especially in the future, is going to have a much heavier influence, a much heavier focus on national interest and particularly uh, an evolution related to national security interests being integrated into and perhaps even pacing the entire uh, theme of that space plan. National security in the context of Japan itself, i.e. the concerns some of us have here on uh, uh, Chinese programs, but also in the context, uh, context of U.S.-Japan cooperation in space, both in national security and in civil programs. The degree to which Japan will participate in our return to the moon. Are they an also-ran, or are they a lead partner for us going forward? These things must be determined and decided literally within the next three to four months. So when we see what the product of that plan is, it'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to discern much more clearly where Japan thinks it's going, wants to go, and perhaps has to go. So my argument is that um, to remain relevant, to remain involved for Japan's national interests, but also in the context of the alliance and in the context of the pillars that Peter uh, previously identified, that plan is going to be very important. And make no mistake about it, the way that Japan has evolved and organized itself to create national space policy in the last five years in particular, the hand on this is Prime Minister Abe. And for that reason, you're going to have a very proactive cabinet office and a very proactive president, excuse me, Prime Minister Abe, as that plan is reviewed, approved, and then approved by the cabinet itself uh, in that February time frame. So with those comments, I think I'll, I'll stop and uh, turn it back over. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Well, I'd like to pick up on, on a theme that cut across all of your presentations, which is that really economic security is national and international security for all of us. Dr. Ghaznami mentioned the need for commercial cooperation across our countries and how that relates to, to national security. And then, and then of course, uh, we, we, we recognize the importance of the interconnected nature of, of space rel relevant to energy and environment and, and, uh, and, of course, what we want to achieve from a defense perspective. 
we have the opportunity, I think, to cooperate across our nations and then also to foster cooperation between the public and private sectors. China doesn't really have much of a challenge in doing that, however. Under, the, under their military-civilian fusion, they can really direct from the top the efforts of a so-called private sector and, uh, and what they're doing within the, the government and the, and the People's Libera Liberation Army. So what I'd like to do is, are there ideas that you have uh, about the relative strength and weaknesses of our, of our two systems, the closed authoritarian system and our free and open systems? And, and how, can we, how can we take advantage of what we see as, as, as our relative advantages to China? And how can we compensate maybe for disadvantages associated with the way China can integrate military and, and civilian? And so I'd like to just open it up to see who wants to go first. And I'd ask each of you maybe to comment on that. So Richard, a quick comment to begin with. Um, this puts me in mind of a trip that we made with, uh, I believe, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld in 2005. And one of the preconditions of us going to China at that time, or accepting their invitation to come, was we wanted access to uh, the people that were developing the space program. At that point, they had uh, orbited, I believe, uh, had an initial orbiting of three, uh, three cosmonauts or whatever. And one of the discussions we had, and it was over dinner, was the Chinese were very proud of what they'd accomplished, obviously. But one of the issues that they put to us was the efficiency with which they were able to uh, launch into space, the benefits they had received, not only one from the so uh, Soviet, excuse me, former Soviet Union technology, but excuse me, the technology they'd managed to in induce from other sources, namely the United States, and the fact that they calculated that probably something like they had spent somewhere between 20 to 25 percent of what we had spent to arrive at the same point in space. So they felt that they had an inherent competitive advantage that would extend out for, for decades. I think what's turned all that on its head is the degree to which the private sector has come into the issue. It's created an entirely new dynamic and a new challenge for any space competitor, including China. And I don't know how they're going to possibly compete with the innovation, the resource base financially, and just the innovation of our, of our private sector. So I think this is a huge change for us that probably no one even saw five years ago. So I, I refer back to the original opening comments, but I think this is a new deal, a new dynamic, and uh, I think we have to take maximum advantage of it. Great, thanks. Thank you. Dr. Kuznani. I think you make a very important point because one of my, my other research projects is looking at China's long-term space ambitions. And so I agree with you that there are three things that gives advantage to China's long-term strategy. One is that they do not have the change of regimes like democracies have. For instance, President Trump might not be there next year. He might be there. There's a focus on the moon today. There might not be a focus. For China, the strategy is determined by President Xi who's argued for the China dream, and within it is the China space dream. And he's president for life. And the important point is that institutionally he has done something very clever, and that is in 2017 there was a revision of the Communist Party of China constitution where China dream is now inscribed into it. So there's continuity. Number two is what you said, civil military integration strategy. So last year, the Politburo established a unit for the first time, which is the civil military integration unit. So President Xi has dictated uh, his important speech, the strategic support force and the China space agencies, including the private sector, is that whatever innovation you do has to be within the civil military integration strategy. Now, that's the advantage. Um, the disadvantage, I would argue, is that what happens if there is an economic downturn? What happens if funding is not there? there as per open source, China's space funding today is about $7 billion. The United States spends about $19 billion just on NASA. India spends about $1.2 billion. But I argue that that should not make either the US or its, spend, uh, or its funding very confident because the turnover from Chinese investment is higher, given the cost is lower. For instance, a Chinese space scientist makes about $2,000 a month. A NASA scientist makes about $10,000 a month. But the return is not, uh, it could be similar. That's, that's, a, that's an important point. Now, in terms of what are the advantages democracies have, 
or as he as you meant the private sector was mentioned i agree that the us private sector is bursting out with innovation reusability but i am concerned that within china too there is this huge growth of private space startups for instance last year as you know ispace launched uh, into orbit uh, i think one space launched into orbit ispace actually has revealed the hyperbola 2 which is a reusable rocket that they aim to launch by 2021 so they are kind of getting inspired by what happens with elon musk when i was in beijing interviewing space policy makers and their academia their argument was that do not be surprised that our private space sector will catch up in the next five years. If you look at the data of investment on their private sector, in just the last two years, they have got funding of up to $2 billion, which was what the US space sector succeeded in about five years. So the time scale is also very different. So those are some of the things we should be concerned about. And I think one of the ways we can undercut that Chinese confidence of long-term strategy is to establish institutional frameworks signed by one administration and followed on by the other. For instance, I give you the example of the next step in strategic partnership and it continues to today. So such mechanisms are important between democracies. Great, I just wanna make a quick point and continue with these comments. Safeguarding technology is gonna be immensely important. I wonder how much of the funding for the so-called Chinese private sector space endeavors came from you know, US venture capital firms, for example, uh, or how much of the technology that they're applying is based on investments they've made in US companies or have stolen or forced a transfer of that technology are you know, our developed technologies into into their companies. Thank thank you. Great comments. <laughs> well, I, I would um, I would argue that uh, we um, do have a, an advantage in the fact that we have an open society and a free market. Therefore, diversity of ideas create more innovation. So that's all fine and good. And that is a great hope for our competitive advantage. China's competitive, competitive advantage has always been the focus of money and vision and effort towards one goal, unwavering. And the, the two problems we, I have with this, though, what's going on right now is, one, China is doing exactly what you alluded to. They steal, duplicate, and then dominate the market. Okay? And if you want evidence, just look at 5G. 5G was China stealing everything from Lucent Technologies, Nortel, and Motorola in the 2000s, bankrupting those three companies and building Huawei out of it, and they dominate 5G in a way nobody competes with right now. America has no answer. So in one decade, they totally they took a market where we said, hey, we're more creative, you know, we're more innovative, and we are failing as a society at competing at 5G. So that's one change that we have to be mindful of, is that they are doing the same thing with the space industry right now. If you're a small space company, you have some white-faced American like me coming in and saying, hey, here's a billion dollars if I can be on your board. But if you follow that money, it's coming from China. The insidious way that they are influencing boards and investors in these companies to steal proprietary information and, uh, and, in, and intellectual property is astounding. It's strategic, it's long-term, but they have their eye on stealing technology on the new space industry, duplicating it, and then flooding the market. If you're a German company right now that wants to launch something into space, China will give you that launch for free if you buy their satellite, and they'll give you the satellite at 90% off well under what any market competitor could provide. That's what they did with technology. For example, 2006, Vietnam, looking for somebody to build their telecommunication infrastructure. So everybody puts out their bids. Lucent Technology put out their bid, Motorola, Nortel. Guess what Huawei's bid was? And back then, they were still a small company. Their bid to build Vietnam's telecommunication market was zero. We'll do it for free. But then when the terms came due, China owns their entire telecommunication markets and their data, which is really the threat here. So that's one point. The second point, though, is speed matters. Space and its network potential to deliver power with speed and range so dominantly 
so fast that whoever gets there first will have a, a determinant advantage. Because from space, with the right network of satellites, you will be able to see and kill anything that flies above the trees. You will be able to paralyze the energy market anywhere on the planet for any society on the planet using solar power and directed energy in a malicious way, not in a way that uplifts the human condition. And third, you can prevent anybody else from getting up there to try to contest you at pennies on the dollar, what it would cost us. So if we do not get to space first, this industrialization of space to deliver energy, transportation, information, and manufacturing before China, we will have to subjugate our will and our values to their will and their value, because the first mover to a new marketplace, especially this dominant, defines the values. And that will be the values that bankrupted technology companies like Lucent and built Huawei and 5G. So speed is the essential variable here. When we saw Germany trying to build a nuclear bomb, it was intuitive to Americans that we had to get the bomb first or we would be speaking German. We knew it. So we didn't turn to the bureaucracy and say, hey, army, build me a bomb. Because we knew a bureaucracy, a big organization, will always move too slow. Instead, President Roosevelt turned to Oppenheimer, the right man or woman, in this case, potentially, and said, Here's some money, here's some freedom outside the bureaucracy. When? Right now, our government is turning to our bureaucracy and saying, build me a space industrial base. And it will take 50 years. Because the statutory and regulatory environments that build up around a certain way of doing things, like we did in the 60s, going to the moon, traps you from doing it differently. This is why Elon Musk is so fed up with the bureaucracy. He has to spend $13 million to the Air Force to launch out of Vandenberg for no reason. It's just in case something might go wrong. And that's non-refundable. $13 million, everything goes good. And he's got to pay that tax. Why? Because the government is so risk averse, it won't let a free market entrepreneur like Elon Musk move at the speed of relevance. So if we as nations rely on our bureaucracies and our governments, even though we have the perfect constellation of leaders in India, in Japan, in America, that see this and want it, if we turn to our bureaucracies, we're not going to move fast. So that's why I think this president needs to charter a Manhattan-type project with the right leader, find the right woman like a Gwen Shotwell at SpaceX, or the right man like Elon Musk at SpaceX, just as two examples and let them move fast outside of the bureaucratic statutory regulatory environment of risk aversion where no risk can be taken that has built up since the 60s till now. Or what will happen is we will be more innovative, but China will steal it faster, duplicate it more quickly, and flood the market with our inventions, and they will be the winners at the top of the heap in 10 years. Another example is advanced batteries. You know, and what uh, Tesla opened the initial factory in China. China duplicated that technology, created their own companies, and then shut out all competitors and have cornered the market for themselves there. Thank, thank you. Mr. Morano. Uh, well, so I'm not sure that it is a clear answer for your questions. But uh, to, con to think about uh, the appropriate relationship between the commercial sector and the national security sector, or how do, how do we deal with the, the combination of those kind of, uh, uh, which mean that national the uh, current trends, policy trends in the national uh, economic security is a uh, part of the national securities. Uh, it, it is not a specific the policy recommendation, but uh, the, in general, the traditionally, at a few years ago, uh, actually the Trump, uh, President Obama in the tw 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 2015 at sunny ones uh, talk to talk to the summit meeting with the President C. The President Obama explained that the difference is the uh, 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 traditional uh, security related national security related traditional espionage and between the difference of the 
the uh, economic espionage to the US uh, public sectors. That in that expressions is the, those activities, traditional espionage and uh, uh, cyber theft against the uh, private sector is the completely different. So they need, they need to distinguish those kind of activities. But when we focus, when we see that current situ actual situation, what happened in these realms, that of course China still continue to do those kind of activities between the combined with the, the uh, uh, commercial sectors and the military applications and developing their capabilities. I think that this uh, assumption is basically that the US is technological leaders. So China has incentive to theft to those, those kind of the information or sensitive data uh, for the, some several uh, ways, including to the cyber theft. So uh, I would like to create that my, uh, uh, what, what I say. It is a general expression. It is not a specific policy recommendation. But if China has some technological advantages, such as specific areas, such specific areas, for instance, the quantum technologies or other uh, space-related technologies, US and allies side, don't you have the same incentive to the same those kind of activities against China? This is just the intelligence operation. So it is not. The, uh, I'm not sure that it is uh, appropriate topic to talk, talk about the, the unclassified environment. But uh, the theoretically and the hypothesis that we need to think about those kind of possibilities. How do we deal with the, those kind of connection between the, those kind of uh, areas, uh, commercial and uh, things. Uh, specific focus on national security area. Great, thank you. I'd like to shift from how do we maintain our competitive advantages, how do we compete effectively in China in terms of developing space capabilities to, again, ensure our security and our freedom and our prosperity, and, and talk a little bit about deterrence. All of you touched on deterrence, and I think some of the themes we heard from each of your, each of your presentations was that deterrence can really be of two kinds, right? Deterrence by denial, convincing your adversary that your adversary cannot accomplish his objectives through the use of force in space in this case, or deterrence by the threat of punitive action later. Uh, Mr. Morano mentioned the, the degree to which adversaries could use ambiguity to their advantage, the way that China uses maritime militias, for example, in the Senkakus. Um, and and that's, a, that's a particular challenge in, in space. And then, and, then, um, and then Dr. Goznami mentioned the importance of awareness, resiliency, and I think our discussion is also touched on alliance networks and how if we have alliances and partners working together, that might inherently increase deterrence because you're bringing other parties into a potential conflict and multiple parties can maybe impose more costs on, a, on an adversary. But if, as we look at evolving our understanding of how to deter conflict in, in space, I just wonder what thoughts you have on, on how well we're thinking about that today and if there are gaps in our thinking and what you might recommend uh, in terms of thinking differently about how to deter conflict in space. And I'll open up to who wants to, anyone who wants to start. Sure, I'll, I'll start this one. And um, I'll, I'll keep it short because deterrence is nothing new. You know, the, the caveman that uh, had a bigger club deterred the caveman that had a smaller club and uh, so on down the line throughout history. Deterrence is nothing more than being able to strike fear in the heart of somebody who would try to hurt you or steal away your, uh, the things you have built for your family, for your tribe, or to force you to do their will. In other words, have you believe in their values. So deterrence is nothing more than striking fear in the heart of somebody who would try to usurp your liberty. And that same ability to strike fear in the heart of your enemy is to strike reassurance in the heart of your friends, the people that believe in the same values. And for America, that's the respect for every human being, that every human being is equally loved by their mothers and fathers, their brothers and sisters, and they have an equal right to believe what they want to believe and live as they want to live, as long as they do not impose uh, their will on somebody else corrosively. So um, I, I set it up that way because space uh, is going to be 
the geography from which you can drive great fear into the hearts of anybody on planet Earth at very cheap price points. It goes back to the fact that all national security is economic. And if there is a blanket of capability over your head, no matter where you're at on planet Earth, and that is owned by China, and they can do anything from that. They can see you, and they can touch you with directed energy, with kinetic energy, if with anything they want, when they dominate the electromagnetic spectrum, and they can dominate information. They can see and they can manipulate your perception of truth, your perception of reality, if they own your data and they own your device. So imagine a blanket over your head, 60 miles up there in space, owned by China. They can see and manipulate everything you see, think, perceive, and stop you anytime they want. They can paralyze you. They can paralyze our military. Talk about the deterrence there. We, as a world community, especially those nations that believe in the same dignity of every human being, have to get together and rethink deterrence in the 21st century. Because the first civilization that gets to space will redefine deterrence in a way that will slowly start making ICBMs um, essentially uh, our, our, um, um, antiques of the past. Because anything that lifts off the ground can be shot down by China with the network from space, as an example. So we better get busy here, because we are still refining a deterrence theory and model based on a World War II model that is not mindful of the information age, the interconnectivity of our markets and our peoples and our cultures, and the power of space to transform the price point by which you can deliver power and take away the goodness of any other civilization in their energy markets, electricity, and information. Thank you. Yes, please. So I think your question, my mind was racing as to what to put forward. But I don't know how many of you have read the book, The China Dream, by Lu Mingfo, Colonel, uh, retired now. So one thing that he pointed out, which is very interesting, based on your question of deterrence, is that he argued that for China, war is the breakdown of a civilization and grand strategy. So if you can win influence and build alliances by using your economic power without having to use violence, you are a superior civilization. The moment you descend to war, you are no more that. So I make that point with seriousness because if you look at what China's doing in space, there are three things that it's hoping to achieve by 2049. And this has been articulated and pointed out by President Xi in his speech to the PLA Strategic Support Force when it was constituted in 2015. And that is one, China has to be in the lead position by 2045 to be able to constitute the norms, constitute norms and standards of behavior in cislunar up to the moon and beyond. So it's fascinating that they're already visualizing a world which is not led by a Western alliance, given the fact that they see that as a disadvantage in their perspective. The second important thing is that he argued that to achieve that future is very important to achieve military capability in space, in which is counter space weapons. That's why they actually demonstrated their 2007 ASAT capability. It's not because they were wanting to use it, but actually to ensure that the United States military, which in their perspective, from a paper that came out from the Academy of Military Sciences in 2005, is very vulnerable because of its dependence on space for command and control, for reconnaissance, for everything almost. And so if you can make that particular domain vulnerable, it deters the United States by extension. And it's fascinating that they actually argued that out and then went about doing it. Now, uh, in terms of how can we build deterrence uh, based on that scenario, I think one way is to understand what China is doing in terms of building countervailing alliances itself. For instance, as you know, space is a very important component of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's called the Belt and Road Information Corridor. And mind you, there are 70 nations that have joined the BRI, and some of the countries that have joined are actually Western allies. New Zealand, which has joined the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, is a 5I member. And so economy, and if you look at the New Zealand discourse, which I've been following, the argument is that they'll be able to handle China's influence, so they can join. But you can see the discrepancy there. What is fascinating from the perspective of space is that this year, China did something which is extraordinary. It signed an MOU with the country that has the most forward-looking 
legislation with regard to space resources, Luxembourg. So China's just signed a MOU with Luxembourg. And guess what Luxembourg got in return? A 500 million BRI bond that was invested in their stock exchange. So it's fascinating how that game is. So based on that, I think for deterrence purposes, it's very important that countries like India, the United States, Japan come together. Now, if you look at, and I'll end here, is that when you talk from the deterrent perspective, even in terms of counter uh, weapons perspective. For instance, we all know that India for the first time tested an ASAT weapon in March of this year in Leo. And so if you look at the Indian argument and justification for that, it was not just counter weapons in space, it was counter value. So what is fascinating from that perspective is that the Indian argument was that China's space capability is threatening India's critical infrastructure. By this, I mean telecommunication, ATM facilities, you know, television, medicine, everything which is dependent on state, weather forecasting. So what India wanted to demonstrate to China as a way of, it didn't mention China, the country, but mentioned the reason why it's doing this, is that it wants to make sure that an adversary nation does not counter its critical infrastructure. So ASAT was seen as demonstrating that. And that's why I say India has changed, and I'll end here, is that had it been Manmohan Singh or the Congress party, which is very careful of India's reputation internationally, an ASAT weapon would have never been tested. But because if you see how the Narendra Modi government, as I mentioned, has changed, it's about showcasing India's power, not shy of international condemnation. For instance, India got flagged for creating space debris, but Modi's argument was that, so what? It makes us more secure as Indian citizens. Who else is going to look after us? So, but then in that context, he also, when he came to the US, and he has developed very deep relationship with Shinzo Abe of Japan, is that we need countries like India, uh, US, Vietnam, Japan, Philippines needs to come together, given this great rise of China and its capability to use its influence without using military power. And so I think that's something that needs to be understood. Thank you. Thank you. Richard? Yeah. Briefly, um, if I could. Um, the question you posed was deterrence. And I think deterrence is about imposing costs. Deterrence is making the person that is making the entity that is thinking of creating a hostile act make a decision whether or not that is going, they're going to have to pay the cost of that. So there's two dynamics here. One is the fact that space, just by definition, is a huge gray area. It's a playground for unam very ambiguous hostile activities against other parties. Uh, we have seen in the past that one country in particular, China defines hostile acts as anything short of war. And there is a whole range, the escalatory ladder is, is essentially endless and the options are endless, particularly for the ability to inflict pain and damage on another party. So I think if we don't begin defining what it is we consider to be acts of war or hostile acts, anything can happen. So deterrence is all about dissuading the other party from doing something that you have already called them out on and made it very clear that you're not going to tolerate. The second component of this, I think, is the ability in the cost, uh, the cost of action category. If you have redundancy in a given system, and here we come into the ability to have multilateral cooperation among like-minded nations. If you have redundancy, whether it's US-Japan, whether it's Japan-India, whatever else it is, the price that that country is going to pay for a hostile act is, in argu is arguably much greater because you're not going to end up with the desired end with that hostile act that you had intended. So this is a whole policy area I don't think that's been explored. But given what's going on in space, everything that's going to be up there in space, and most importantly, the capabilities that we're talking about, the options here for hostile activity are endless. And we just have to think, what is the deterrent structure that we're going to create among ourselves and then hopefully enforce? And of course, we've been focusing on China in this discussion. But of course, there are other actors that could be hostile to us as Absolutely. well rogue actors and so forth, as well as other, as other hostile, or, 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 as well as hostile states. Uh, Mr. Morano. Uh, well, so the, as the, Mr. Rores pointed, pointed, pointed out that 
uh, there are some several uh, fundamentals for uh, when we considering about the deterrence in the space domain. The first is that uh, deter the relatively the deterrence by punishment is relatively difficult to the, the in the space domain. The second is the we needed to seek to the same specific posture, the, which means that physically uh, the physically uh, dispersed or the distributed, but operationally integrated. From that context, I, I, I already pointed out that importance of the hosted payload program between the other each allies. Uh, so in addition, I, from the Japan's perspective, uh, I have some uh, several the policy recommendations. For instance, to strengthen our resilience and uh, reducing the incentive to potential adversaries to strengthen our, our launch site or launch capabilities. If Japan, Japan's satellites were a part of launch vehicle to the uh, previously restored in the US at some contingencies or crisis happens, it could, could be launched from the US territory, such as the Cape Canaveral or Brandenburg. Those capabilities is not a cheap, uh, it's just a one of the option, but it could be some redundant or re strengthen our re resiliency and show of the willingness, the cooperation between the a tie, strength, strengthening tie between the US and Japan. That is one of the, the example to, to upgrade into the, our cooperation. Great, thank you. Well, we have about six minutes left, I think, before, are we gonna take a break, I think, after this, right? Before the next presentation, short break. So what I'd like to do, rather than continue to ask questions, is ask each of you, maybe, to, su to summarize what you'd like to leave this group with, or, or, or to say, in, 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 as we conclude, as we conclude the panel. Um, I know all of us have benefited tremendously already from the, your expertise and the comments you've made, but I thought maybe we'll go in the, in the initial order um, and, um, and start with General Quast, and then ask you to, to just quickly maybe summarize, uh, really what you'd like to summarize, or, to, or, to, or you really share with us your final thoughts. Well, thank you. So I, I think that um, we, at least in America, have been stuck in a paradigm that was created in World War II to create an international security system uh, that was stable and allowed um, free markets and uh, prosperity to grow globally. Uh, that, uh, and that same statutory and regulatory environment, at least within our government, is, is preventing us from doing the same thing with space. That we are, we are moving, we are looking, we are considering, but we're moving too slow. And we're moving too slow not because we uh, couldn't move faster, we're moving too slow in relation to our competition. And our competition is China and Russia to some extent, or any country. You know, it doesn't matter how big the country is. When Spain, a small country, or Portugal, a small country, figured out deep sea navigation and, and sail and wooden ships, they dominated the global economy. And so did England, a very small country. So it's not about the size, it's about the strategy. And here we are moving into a new realm. It will be more powerful than the invention of the airplane, the ship, and the nuclear weapon combined. And we are tinkering around with it and just moving at a pace of the market. And China will beat us to that because China is building a navy in space with the equivalent of battleships and, and uh, aircraft carriers that can shoot to kill and can maneuver faster and do it all cheaper because of the e economics of the network of space. And we are building buoys and lighthouses that can see what's going on, but will not be able to compete with the firepower, the maneuver, and the commu ubiquitous communication and economic profit that China will gain. Trillion dollar markets globally in information, inf energy, manufacturing, and transportation. They will profit from that. They will use that to build their dominance economically, and they will own this geography. We have to move fast, and right now, we are not moving fast enough. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dr. Kosnami. Thank you. I think my, my three points based on summarizing is that, one, as I mentioned earlier when I started, is that the context of space and how we view it has changed. It's no more about humanity going there and coming back. It's become more about establishing sustainable presence and so that's something that has to be considered and understood. And based on that, I think what an alliance structure could actually do is to establish a common 
uh, industrial and development concept of where space needs to go. I think the final point is that if you look at how, and this is something important because first the vision, uh, second the understanding that space is no more about showing off your technology during the Cold War and coming back, but about being present uh, permanently and using space for your economic development as China articulates national re rejuvenation and revival. And so, and the final point I would make is that, and this is something that I see as an example in the South China Sea, is that for China's strategic culture, if you establish presence somewhere first, you have first presence entitlement to that particular territory. For instance, in, for in the disputed islands in the South China Sea, the Chinese argument is that because our fishermen and our, our people historically have been there first, it belongs to us, Tibet. You know that the Dalai Lama is in exile in India, Tibet, the same discourse. So what they were having suzerainty, but we had first presence because of the resources there too. And I think that's something very important. And then when we talk about deterrence, I mean, if you look at China's ability to build artificial islands in the South China Sea and have no cost for it till today, I think that's something that we'll have to consider once China establishes presence on the lunar South Pole, which they aim to do by 2036. Thank you very much. All right, uh, 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 Mr. Rano. Oh, well, Richard, I'll go to you to clean up again. Thanks. Yes. So <laughs> I, I already there pointed out the importance of the what is the, the priorities for the, our, policy, our space security policies. But uh, in this floor, maybe some number of the people, some number of the persons are actually the, are involved to the same actual policy planning or strategy, strategy planning process. I think that. Today we are uh, already show, uh, we are showing to the some what is the challenges, the, what is the the important point. So how do we deal with the, those kind of challenges and coordinate with each other? I think that the sh uh, 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 capping some the challenges and the, uh, spe some specific policy is a relatively easy. Uh, the difficulty is the prioritizations. Prioritization is the one of the core elements of the strategic planning and the, creating the strategy. So actually, that uh, General McMaster uh, uh, well known about those kind of difficulties. How do we coordinate with the using the limited resources and applying to the prioritized? How do we cut all the the more or less uh, prioritized areas? So in that sense, that we needed to we we means that uh, U.S. and its allies and partners. Uh, should start to be the planning to the space domains. The how do we deal with? How do we prioritize? What kind of the area is more important for the, for each countries? How do we de adjusting to the, our policy priorities using the limited resources? I think that that, that is one of uh, 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 more important discussion for, for discussing part of the, about some opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly, I think the net net <coughs> I take away from this today is that given the magnitude of the opportunities that are out there, but given the range of challenges and obstacles and hurdles we face, this is again something the United States, even if we take the handcuffs off the private sector, can't do alone. We just can't. Uh, there's too much involved out there and the journey is going to be very long and it's going to be very difficult if we're going to dominate or at least co-dominate, hopefully not, space. So to do that, I think each of the world leaders that are involved have to ask one another. They have to decide, first of all, what they want out of this, but then they have to ask their counterpart, their peer, what are you going to do about this? And we have to ask, we don't have to wait and be very tentative about this. If we see something that an India or a Japan or another country can contribute, we have to say to them, we need this and we need it now. We don't need it eight years from now. And if they see something that they believe they need, redundancy, a hosted payload, whatever it is, they have to be upfront about it, ask about it, and press us. It's sort of like no more Mr. Nice Guy among the guys in the band. Everybody has to say what they need, what they want, because bottom line, I don't think we can do it alone. Thank you. Well, just in summary, what I'd like to do is, first of all, thank all of you for tremendous presentations and, and insights. And I, I'll just say that during my, my time here in Washington, I was very proud of, of one of our accomplishments, which was 
the development of a space strategy, uh, a classified as well as a public-facing space strategy, that I think integrated to an unprecedented degree our efforts in defense and across the commercial sector. And I think what we're seeing is a tremendous momentum based on really the focus of our mind on our competition, a wake up maybe to the, to the competition and how important it is going to be for us to, to compete effectively, to, to maintain really our security, our freedom and our prosperity in, in space. And, and I can't thank all of you enough because I think we have an opportunity now to take the work that all of us have done, each of our nations have done, and in the context of the free and open Indo-Pacific, extend our cooperation in, in an even a more full way. It's already happening, but even a more full way uh, in, into space. And thank you for adding your thoughts, your insights. Uh, I think I'll just end with Mr. Morano's uh, point um, on, on prioritization, and then, and then Mr. Lawless's point on it's gonna take all of us to do this. So I just encourage all of us in the audience here today to really have a hand in, in really focusing all of our attention on our goal and then looking for opportunities that we can exploit, identifying better what are, what are the obstacles, what are the dangers, how do we overcome those obstacles and protect against those dangers. But please join me in a round of applause for our extraordinary panelists. Thank you so much.
If we could take our seats, please. We'd like to continue with the final portion of this program. Hello, everyone. I'm Patrick Cronin. I'm the Asia-Pacific Security Chair here at Hudson Institute. And it was a real delight uh, working with our Japan Chair, H.R. McMaster, Ben Gilman, who is the assistant to the Japan Chair, with uh, Riho Aizawa, uh, with uh, Masashi Murano, and others here at Hudson to put on today's program. We've had just a fabulous uh, list of speakers today, and, and really now they've shown us just how complex, how compressed, um, how competitive everything is in space, and how you develop space policy at this time is one of the most urgent matters uh, for the U.S. government and for U.S. allies uh, like Japan and, and partners like India. Um, you know, John Mencken started us off so well with the big question um, and really the thesis that everything we know in space is changing. And he knows a lot more about space than I do. Um, so when he says that, uh, that's a profound statement. Um, and then we heard essentially testament to that from each one of the following speakers, just how much is changing. Uh, Peter Gerritsen, I think, calling very clearly for really new foundations, um, the quest for setting values and norms. Um, General Kloss essentially uh, repeated this, that the first mover to space won't just be determining transportation, energy, manufacturing, and information, but really dominates and becomes preeminent economically and, because of that, militarily. Um, we heard the importance from um, Dr. Gwaswami of uh, Namrata Goswami about the possibility of a, pos a vision with India, um, that this is something, a moment to be seized, the next st stage of cooperation between the United States and India just as we heard from Richard Lawless about the fact that Japan's new space plan is now a pivotal period for determining what Japan will do in space and therefore what the United States and Japan can do in national security and in space. Um, and so all of these speakers, and Murano-san uh, here from Hudson talking about how profoundly deterrence and deterrence concepts are going to be changing and affected by thinking about uh, space. These are issues for our allies, um, but how you work with the private sector, in the multitude of actors working in the private sector, how we work with our allies, uh, how we uh, cooperate where possible with competitors and rivals, but also uh, how we compete with them are critical questions of, of uh, policy. So with that introduction, it is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mir Sadat, uh, who is uh, first and foremost uh, a naval officer. Um, we've talked a lot about how freedom of the seas and how much uh, free seas uh, is something like the, the challenge in space. Will it remain free or closed? Um, and and um, so very important to have that background. Um, his tours in Afghanistan, I mean, he has uh, uh, been in, um, in conflict zones um, in ways that um, space is not yet becoming <laughs> that quite a conflict zone, but certainly more contested in clashing values, but building foundations, thinking deterrence. These are issues he's thought of from the ground up. He's been a professor and an expert on Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. Um, and since uh, the beginning of this year, he has been the director of defense policy and, and strategy at the National Security Council. Uh, General McMaster mentioned one of the things he was most proud of at the NSC was getting that space strategy uh, codified by the Trump administration. And you are the man right now who is helping to shepherd that and. Uh, heard all the cats here on, on space policy and strategy. So um, I hope I haven't built that up too much for you, Mir, but you know, it is a great pleasure. Please welcome Dr. Mir Sadat. Good morning or uh, good afternoon. Um, so the most controversial piece about this is not what you think it is. It's is it going to be Captain Kirk or Colonel Kirk, all right? Will space officers like army officers, uh, army generals and air force generals be issued guns in space? Uh, how will the uniform look like? Will it be a jumpsuit? What color? And uh, what about the moniker of the service? And we know there are a couple of distinguished scholars among us who have talked about that uh, and are leading the debate, a very fruitful debate, very useful debate. Um, so. Let me extend a thank you uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, hopefully, I will not rehash things you've already discussed. Um, 
I've had the privilege of studying most of the people who've presented today their works, General McMaster's works at the NSC. Uh, this perspective that I'm going to give to you is going to be primarily a security-focused lens, a lens that has informed the President of the United States on space for over 60, uh, for over six decades, even before the October 1957 Sputnik shock, the world's first artificial satellite launched by the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Back then, the Soviet Union was a major driver of post-World War II alignment. The United States and its allies faced a single conventional enemy during the Cold War, after which the United States led the effort to globalize the international order. The United America did not want a system disrupted by mainly the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, and China. The thinking was, if they're part of the system, they will not disrupt the so-called rules-based order. Then came the attacks of September 11, 2001, and many of us in uniform and civilians have had first-hand uh, encounters either here or in overseas contingency operations uh, dealing with them. That shifted the entire momentum of the 1990s push. It brought a new era of global security posture for the international community and also for global governance. <clears throat> this period of uncertainty that was caused was not caused by the hands of a state actor like Russia or China, but it was a nefarious uh, non-state actor with global potential, Al-Qaeda. Very soon, we also saw the effects of the 19th push for the interconnected global market coming to an end with the financial crisis of 2007, a time when our 401k, 401ks dwindled, our home prices plummeted, and un unemployment uh, surged to uh, almost 10%. Since then, the prospect of bringing Russia or China into the so-called world order in which we were the most powerful player has diminished. Global outsourcing and liberal, liberalization efforts backfired and resulted in unintended consequences. Globalization led to a loss of expertise in production of U.S. industrial goods, fueled the, fueled the growth of counterfe uh, counterfeiting of parts and components in many industries and even resulted in the compromise of sophisticated technologies and sensitive information, not just for the United States, but for many of our allies. In the defense industry, counterfeit parts affect the safety, operational readiness, and critical nature of the US military, especially as we continue to uh, track and target violent jihadist terrorism. As we now focus more on existential threats, our foreign policy, ex foreign policy and export control communities today have heightened concerns about the U.S. supply chain integrity, the theft of American innovation, and want to mitigate vulnerabilities in our technology, service, and critical infrastructures. The United States still advocates for a global marketplace that embraces fair and open competition, free trade, and respects intellectual property rights. Our nation's free and open trade needs protection from threats undermining our strategic leadership role in the global marketplace and our dominance across the shared domains. As it does, during the last few years, these threats are addressed within the context of great power competition and national security strategy that my organization published in 2017 under General McMaster's leadership. When discussing great power competition, of course, we tend to focus on China and the disputes of the Indo-Pacific, such as the South China Sea. We also think about Russia, Europe, Eurasia, and the fragmented fault lines across sections of the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia, where great powers converge. But nowhere is great power com competition as ambiguous and nebulous than in space. Great, great power competition in space is in some ways analogous to the great game of the 19th and 20th centuries between Great Britain and Russia, which competed over access and access to resources and geostrategic positioning in Central and South Asia. Today, there's a similar, similar great ga game brewing between China and other spacefaring nations led by the United States across uh, over access to potential cislunar resources and overall space dominance. This has major implications for our modern way of living, our national economic well-being, and the security of our nation and our allies. Currently, our space systems provide strategic and tactical warning of impending threats, monitor the agricultural industrial base, secure timely fin financial transactions, give trustworthy positioning, navigation, timing, and weather forecasts. And of course, assured co communications across all lines of uh, efforts. Just imagine, in comparison to the 9-11 attacks or the market crash of 2007, what the magnitude of degradation, disruption, destruction of our overhead space-derived capabilities will have on our societies. 
Not surprisingly, the 2017 National Security uh, Strategy says the United States considered, considers unfettered access to and freedom to operate in space to be a vital interest. I interpret vital interest something for which you're going to fight for. The National Security Strategy further elaborates that any harm inter harmful interference with or attack upon critical components of our space architecture that directly affects vital U.S. interests will be met with a deliberate response at any time, any place, any manner, and in, and in a domain of our choosing, whether land, air, sea, cyber, or space. The National Security Strategy calls for advancing space as a priority. With respect to space now, what does this mean for us in the National Security Council? <clears throat> Besides having to run last minute to the building here, uh, for, for being late in another meeting. So uh, we in the, in the National Security Defense Directorate and our peers, the new, newly reestablished National Space Council, hold coordination meetings and working groups to address current and future opportunities, as well as challenges to our national security, commercial, and civil, line, civil space lines of effort. So three different effort lines. In fact, a surgical rewrite of the 2010 National Space Policy has started through issuance of various uh, SPDs, EOs, and NSPMs, basically presidential memorandum. Our space policy will not only catch us up to the realities of today. So 2010, when the president last signed it, it was probably written sometime in 20, 2008 and in coordination for about a year, right? So it's, it's almost a decade plus old. So this national security, uh, national space policy that we will promulgate will not only catch us up to the realities of today's, but to the imaginative uh, um, realm of future, tomorrow. Two months ago, US Space Command was resurrected as a, a combatant command. We now look to the Hill to authorize the creation and funding of a new military branch, the United States Space Force. Space Command and Space Force are two different things that are sometimes confused, but they are complementary and dependent initiatives. Space Command, will focus on joint warfighting operations in space, manned by assigned Navy, Army, Air Force, Marine, military, and civilian personnel, who will support the command with their terrestrial-focused capabilities. Therefore, without a unique space force focused primarily on space, there will be no one solely dedicated, responsible, or accountable to recruit, train, develop doctrine, or equip the nation's space warriors. The United States cannot wait for another 9-11 in space. And we definitely cannot wait for perhaps a full-on Pearl Harbor-style attack on American, const American satellite constellations to convince our US decision makers that it is time to create a space force. That would be akin to waiting on World War II to convince leaders to build the US Air Force, which was finally built in 1947. Due to the Air Force's amazing success, no ground troops have been killed by enemy manned aircraft attacks since the end of the Korean War in 1953. How many troops were lost in World War II because we focused on familiar land and sea domains and turned a blind eye to emerging threats and opportunities in space? Consider that it may have been better to have built the Air Force in 1927 or any other time prior to the beginning of World War II rather than 1947. How many troops, civilians, and satellite assets will we lose if we in 2019 delay the creation of a service to think about space warfare until the next war. And therefore, the United States cannot afford to fight a World War II style conflict knowing that the operational battle space has exponentially expanded to include space. Although our space systems support the terrestrial forces, actions in space also affect our future conflicts here on Earth. Any opponent who controls space may hold our population centers and our deployed forces, Navy guy, at risk without ever taking a terrestrial action. In this new era of multi-domain warfare, our competitive margin of dominance is shrinking, primarily because the bipolar environment upon which America's space enterprise was constructed, the Cold War strategic environment no longer exists. And so the United States, and also the United States prefers space to remain free from conflict, but China and Russia have actively exhibited warfare capabilities in space. The United States is merely rebuilding a set of capabilities that have atrophied over decades to strategically compete in the face of even more capable rivals. For many years, states from Russia and China to North Korea and Iran have pursued weapons to jam, blind, disable our navigation and communication satellites via electronic attacks from the ground. 
China and Russia have both conducted highly sophisticated own orbit activities that could enable them to maneuver their satellites into close proximity with ours, posing unprecedented new dangers to our space systems. In particular, these experiments entail orbital maneuvering of military spacecraft. Moreover, Chinese academics and foreign policy leaders have written an avalanche of papers going back to 2005 advocating for the placement of laser weapons in space. China and also Russia have developed, tested, and fielded counter space capabilities to deny the US, its allies, and partners, and the commercial sector the use of space-based systems during crisis and conflict. China will ultimately not only deploy laser weapons on the ground, but perhaps even in space. Russia has mirrored China's development of counter space capabilities. I encourage you to consult the recently released DIA and NASIC space threat re reports for more details on this. Particularly to the Indo-Pacific, the multiple threats include Chinese space activities and their behavior in the South China Sea, the in increased air and naval activity in and around Japan by Russia and China, North Korea's continued ballistic missile threat, and the growing anti-satellite ASAT capabilities of other states. By no means will India be the last nation to test an ASAT. Expect more in the future. This will likely increase the chance of mishap in space. Therefore, precautionary requirements are perhaps needed. To put that in perspective, in 2007, when China conducted a kinetic ASAT test on its dead weather satellite, it created a debris field of almost 3,400 pieces, more than half of which are expected to be still in orbit by 2027. So you see, the assumption that space would have remained a sanctuary or uncontested is no longer valid. The United States and its allies do not necessarily have dominance over space. No amount of wishful thinking can make our adversaries, their capabilities, the evolving space environment, or our shortcomings go away. Of course, military strength in any domain should be avoided through soft power such as diplomacy and the deterrence of hard power by making any attacks undesirable and costly. Nonetheless, space tends to, uh, I'm sorry, nonetheless, history tends to be cyclical. Maybe space too, right, if you keep on going. We can either prepare and posture or do the right thing, or we can be unprepared when faced by conflict. So with each passing day, great power competition across all domains becomes even more the norm, and potential adversaries become more competent and capable in space. Like any land or maritime conflict, America will never go to war without its allies, and this is especially true in space. In space, we may partner with, protect, and inform our allies, be they governments, our organizations. In fact, in the civilian and commercial sector, we can think about satellites as being hostile, friendly, or non-combatants in a potential battle space. Recently, my colleague, Dr. Scott Pace, speaking at the 70th International Astronaut Astronautical or Congress, explained that the United States promotes common values shared by international partners, protect US national interests, and enable commercial sector leadership and growth in space. If humanity is to have a future in space, it should it should be a future in which space is home of peoples and nations that share at least at least, and respect similar values for rule of law, democracy, economic freedom, and human rights. Those common values have evolved across the air, land, and sea domains in which we have operated with, far, uh, with partners, forging unique capabilities, authorities, and talents to bear down on shared common threats. These values will inform the shared acceptable norms and behavior, ensuring freedom of access and use of space, which, chi which China and Russia are challenging across all shared domains today. And the nations of the Indo-Pacific region are neither exempt or isolated from this trend. While space is not subject to claims of so sovereignty or direct control like the other physical domains, we need to ensure that the rules governing space are created by responsible spacefaring nations who share our values. That is why our partnerships are going to be key uh, a key element of our success in this era of great power competition. For example, Space Command has over 100 space situational awareness agreements. About 80 are with commercial companies. There are about 22 with nations around the world. In addition, we hold the Shriva War Games, which studies how future conflict extends into space. Shriva War Games exhibits the growing security cooperations with the Five Eye partners, uh, France and Germany and Japan. The need to share space intelligence, operations, and technology will drive a review of space classifications that may likely increase space uh, technology transfers, coalition exercises, and partnerships in space. 
there may be also potential opportunities in future years, especially for partnerships with Indo-Pacific regional players on furthering space situational and maritime domain awareness using both space and terrestrially based assets. Opportunities also exist for international cooperations in space debris mitigation, operating standards, and effective lines of communications for orbital operations. These are great potential opportunities for Indo-Pacific nations such as Japan, Australia, and India. And of course, these partnerships are even more likely to happen in our civil space sector as we look to send humans to deep space again, first to the moon and then on to Mars. In fact, NASA is seeking partnerships with US industry and international partners for the nascent Artemis lunar project. The moon has never been more within reach. I'm from Southern California, as General knows. Uh, three-day commute by car, it's a three-day commute to the moon from Earth. So probably safer. <laughs> um, after we land the first American woman and next American man near the South Pole of the moon, which is 25% larger than the surface of the African continent. The plan is to create a sustainable lunar presence to include a, a crew rendezvous point, science laboratory, and propellant depot at the NASA Gateway in high lunar orbit and lunar surface operations that will inform humanity's destination to Mars. For this journey, they may be potential to make use of lunar minerals, metals, and water resources. Without going into the technical or project specifics, this effort represents tremendous partnerships and opportunities for the Indo-Pacific spacefaring nations. To put this in perspective, economic impact estimates project that the US space economy will grow between three to eight fold over the next few decades, an approximately $2.7 trillion space economy. American efforts in the commercialization of space are vital explain to you what vital means to our national interest because it reflects U.S. security investments in space. The future space operating environment is expected to be exponentially more voluminous and diverse. Emerging commercial ventures such as satellite servicing, debris removal, <clears throat> in-space manufacturing, tourism, and cutting-edge technologies enabling small sat and expansive satellite constellations are outpacing efforts to develop and implement government policies and processes to address these new activities. As new, state, as new uh, space actors and capa capabilities emerge, there'll be a need for more work on the implementation of principles guided by the Outer Space Treaty and related guidelines in order to avoid risking the stability and security of the outer space environment. On the other hand, the Chinese are actively working to undermine any such efforts and have laid out a 30-year cislunar economic plan that will supposedly generate $10 trillion by 2050, three times the size of our estimated economy. If true, we must create a collaborative, conscientious setting in which our nations, with, in which other nations choose to align themselves and their space activities with us, the United States, as opposed to those without any regard to space oper the space operating environment. We need to think about space before we lose space. Right now, we have the competitive advantage but that advantage is rapidly eroding as peer and near-peer competitors ascend to space without any regard for space, as they are aided by advanced technologies which they might have stolen from others. A recent Air Force Futures report claimed that by 2060, space will be a significant engine of national, political, economic, and military power, and that the United States must commit to having a military force structure that can defend this international space order and defend American space interests to include American space settlements and commerce. It will be the US Space Force, which will provide the necessary expertise for the US Space Command to ensure unfettered access to and the freedom to operate within space. US Space Command will provide vital effects and capabilities to joint and coalition partners during peacetime and across the spectrum of conflict. Just as the US Navy, will pitch my Navy right, uh, just as the UN, U.S. Navy stands the watch to ensure that we freely navigate the world's seas, such as those in the Indo-Pacific, America must now ensure the freedom to navigate through space. If we continue to delay the creation of a U.S. Space Force until it is too late, we jeopardize the com comforts of our American life, the lifeline of our economy, the enabling of our national security assets, and the execution of, ex of priorities, especially in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere around the world. 
Let me conclude. I see no sleeping heads here, which is good. Let me conclude by drawing your attention to the start of my talk. While the Cold War is over, great power competition is back, and the great game ensues for cis-lunar leadership. Spacefaring nations need to decide whether they want to be part of the same routine, boring thing in space, stranded on a Chinese space station, or do they want to do something, I'm talking as if I'm talking to kids, right, and like get them all energized, or do they want to do something that's spectacular, amazing, exciting, and explore the moon and Mars with us, the United States? It would be nice to see one of our Indo-Pacific partners be the first Asian to walk on the moon. America has, has always been ready for a challenge, a good challenge, a tough challenge. We are natural explorers and innovators. We create, we don't steal. We have an American entrepreneurial spirit, scientific curiosity, a strong sense of patriotism, and a belief in teamwork, which are the right ingredients for success in space. But to achieve this, the government's vision, our government's vision, our scientific community's rigor, Inspiring entrepreneurs with cool rockets and our allies' comparative advantages must all synchronize. To win the great game in space, we must ensure our economy, innovative technology, and national security are a priority. Thank you. Sorry, if we'd take advantage, since he's willing to take a couple of questions, sir, we had your hand up first. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your uh, insightful uh, statement. Uh, I'm a reporter from Voice of America Korean Service. I was just wondering, like, you mentioned about the uh, partnership uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, and I was wondering, like, how does uh, the uh, decision of GSOMIA uh, with South Korea and Japan uh, implies on space cooperation? Uh, in information sharing basis, not only on North Korean threat, but also on the space initiative that U.S. is leading? <laughs> yeah. All right. We're talking about the intelligence sharing agreement between Korea and Japan and okay, the fact that... Is, I'm not speaking for the government, obviously. <laughs> but it's bad, right? It's bad. And, and, uh, and I think that, you know, as we, as we look at the competition from China, really our free and open societies, our countries have to be close together, right? And, and when I had the privilege of working uh, with, with, our, with our counterparts in, in Japan and in South Korea, we came to the agreement that every time that China was, would be aggressive, but really in connection with North Korea, as you're mentioning, every North Korean provocation ought to result in us being seen as even closer together, working even closer together. Because North Korea and China, from an adversarial perspective, will use divisions against us, right? So, so I think it, it's really time for us to remember the past, right, and honor the memory of the past, difficult memories. But really, we ought to base decisions today on the present and the future, right? And so uh, I think it's, I think it's a, a huge uh, you know, disadvantage to all of us if, if this agreement is, is, uh, you know, is, is broached. Thank you very much. And we've, we've got very little time here, but I, this hand over here, so. You mentioned that one of the true marks of an advanced civilization is being able to um, avoid war at all costs. Um, in terms of the U.S. space strategy, you also mentioned preventing 9-11 in space. How would the two go hand in hand? So the, 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 one of the military priorities is always to avoid conflict if you can avoid conflict. Uh, so y you know you will use diplomacy uh, as much as you can, whether it's State Department diplomacy or mil to mil military to military diplomacy. Uh, and also you're going to make uh, deterrence, uh, which is the, the hard power of that, right? Not the soft power. You're going to make it costly for them, make it painful for them, uh, uh, whether it's economic, uh, diplomatic, um, information-wise. Uh, or military. Uh, you, you know, the last thing uh, a military person wants to do is engage in a 
kinetic or a physical confrontation. So uh, that hard power piece is going to be, you're going to employ all the other national instruments of power before you. Uh, if they have a bad intention to do a 9-11 style attack. If someone takes out our uh, uh, national, commercial, and civil, the, eight, 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 you know, the 800 or so satellites that we are mostly dependent on, uh, then you know, we're toast. We, we won't be able to have eyes, ears, nothing in space or our troops uh, on the ground and on land or those at sea. So that's, that's the, the piece you want to look at. It's sort of like uh, in the old wars, wars we had you know, the Trojan horse. That, that would be the analogous piece to it. Um, Mayor, maybe we have time for one more question. And this lady right here. Um, Yuan from Radio Free Asia. And is there any specific US uh, space strategy that deals with uh, threats from North Korea? Um, can't necessarily comment on that. So <laughs> can't, I can't comment on that. Uh, but. Um, I don't know if you saw Bloomberg two days ago. They had a good uh, piece on uh, the National Intelligence uh, uh, Council. The, the NIC and ODI are revising the intelligence estimate. I would refer you to their public affairs office and ask that for, to them. They probably would be able to give you a better, succinct answer. Well, Mayor, you reminded us how busy you are and uh, suggesting that hopefully there's a lot of progress going on with all those meetings that you're chairing and that you're leading. Uh, we certainly hope so. We deeply appreciate you taking time away from the building to come over here and talk about U.S. space strategy. This is a very exciting issue. We're delighted that the administration is renewing our interest in securing space. It's more complex. It's more compressed. It's intense more than ever before. So good luck to you. Please uh, thank Dr. Mir Sadat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, that's our program. Thank you very much.